four to begin. In, in five, four, three, two, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome the committee members, the participants, and the public uh, to the 183rd a vaccine and related biological products advisory committee meeting. Uh, today we will be discussing the strain selection for the flu virus vaccines 2024 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. To start us off, uh, the designated federal officer of the meeting, Dr. Susan Paydar, will go over administrative announcements, roll call, and conflict of interest statements. Before we do that, one reminder to my committee members, uh, colleagues, to use the uh, raise your hand uh, function in Zoom in order for me to be able to see who has a question or a comment, and I can uh, call on you. And now I turn it over to Dr. Pedar. Thank you, Dr. El Sali. Good morning, everyone. This is Susan Pidar, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer for today's 183rd Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, and the committee, I'm happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the strain selection for the influenza virus vaccines for the 2024 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on August 24, 2023. Next slide, please. At this time, I would like to acknowledge outstanding leadership of Dr. Peter Marks, Director of Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Dr. David Caslow, Director of Office of Vaccines Research and Review, Dr. Ware, Director of Division of Viral Products, OVRR, and Dr. Sudhakar Agnihotram, Acting Senior Advisor to the Office Director, Office of Vaccines Research and Review. Next slide, please. I also would like to thank my Division Director, Dr. Prabhakara Atreya, for her excellent leadership and my team whose contributions have been critical for preparing today's meeting, Ms. Valerie Vasio, Ms. Joanne Lipkine, and Ms. Lisa Johnson. I also would like to express our sincere appreciation to Master Joseph Ely in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working very hard behind the scenes trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one, like all the previous VRPAC meetings. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at FDA OMA at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionists for today's meeting are Catherine Diaz and Deborah de la Croce from Translational Excellence. We'll begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and temporary non-voting member. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your first and last name, institution, and areas of expertise. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please see the member roster slides in which we'll begin with, doc, uh, with Chair Dr. Hannah Sahli. Next slide, please. Great. Good morning, uh, Hannah Sahli. Uh, I'm at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'm an adult infectious diseases physician and my research is in clinical vaccine development. Great, thank you. Next slide, Dr. Paula Anunziata, our industry representative. Good morning. My name is Paula Annunciato. I'm the head of the ID and Vaccines Global Clinical Development at Merck, and I'm the uh, non-voting industry representative for today's meeting. Thank you. Dr. Henry Bernstein. Good morning. Um, my name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell. I'm a general uh, pediatrician with expertise in vaccines. Great, thank you. Dr. Archana Chatterjee. Good morning. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Rosalind Franklin University in North Chicago. I am a pediatric infectious diseases specialist with a focus on vaccines. 
Great, thank you. Next slide. Dr. Um, Amanda, Captain Amanda Kahn. Good morning, um, I'm Dr. Amanda Kahn. I'm a pediatrician at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the National Center for Immunizations and Respiratory Diseases, where um, I work on vaccine preventable disease epidemiology and policy. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Haley Gans. Hi, I'm Haley Gans, a professor of pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease at Stanford University Medical Center. And my area of expertise is on vaccine immunology. Thank you. Dr. Holly James. Good morning. Um, I'm Holly James. I'm uh, um, at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. Um, I'm a biostatistician by training and my um, expertise and focus is in uh, vaccine evaluation. Great, right, thank you. Dr. Arnold Monto. I'm Arnold Monto. I'm uh, at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where I work on the epidemiology and prevention of respiratory infections, particularly vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Next slide, um, Dr. Paul Offit. Yes, um, good morning. My name is Paul Offit. I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and my expertise is in mucosal vaccines and vaccine safety. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Stephen Pergat. Hey, Stephen. Um, I'm Steve Pergam. I'm uh, an adult infectious disease physician at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and my expertise is on immunosuppressed um, individuals, particularly bone marrow and immunological emergency patients. Right. Thank you. Next is Dr. Stanley Perlman. Uh, good morning. I'm Stanley Perlman in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and Pediatrics at the University of Iowa. My specialty is in coronaviruses, and, and I am a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Thank you. Next slide, please. Dr. Jay Portnoy, our com uh, consumer representative. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and I'm an allergist immunologist at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Thank you. Next is Dr. Eric Rubin. Hi, I'm Eric Rubin. I'm an adult infectious disease uh, physician at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and Harvard Medical School and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you. Dr. Andrea Shane. Hi, good morning. Um, I, I'm Andy Shane. I'm uh, a pediatric infectious diseases at Emory University in Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and my area of interest and expertise is in vaccine epidemiology. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next, we'll do a roll call of our temporary non-voting member, Dr. David Wentworth. Good morning. Uh, this is Dave Wentworth. I'm the director of our WHO Collaborating Center and the National Influenza Center for the U.S. at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wentworth. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we have a total of 15 participants, 13 voting, and two non-voting members. Now I'll proceed with reading the FDA Conflict of Interest Disclosure Statement for the public record. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is convening virtually today, October 5, 2023, for the 183rd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, FERPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, PACA, of 1972. Dr. Hanal Sali is serving as the chair for today's meeting. Today, on October 5, 2023, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the strain selection for the influenza virus vaccines for the 2024 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties, PMISB. With the exception of the industry representative member, all standing and temporary non-voting members of VRPAC are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including 
but not limited to 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S. Code Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant wa uh, waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interest involved or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as a temporary non-voting member and speaker for this meeting, Dr. David Wentworth. Dr. David Wentworth is employed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He is the director, WHO, Collaborating Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology and Control of Influenza. He's also the director, Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, CORVD at CDC. Dr. Wentworth, is an internationally known expert in influenza virus epidemiology, worldwide influenza disease burden, and influenza virus vaccines. Dr. Wentworth is a regular government employee and has been screened for conflicts of interest and cleared to participate as both a speaker and as a temporary non-voting member for today's meeting. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance, as a speaker and temporary non-voting member, Dr. David Wentworth is not only allowed to respond to the clarifying questions from the committee members, but also authorized to participate in committee discussions in general. However, he is not authorized to participate in committee voting process. Dr. Paula Anunziata of Merck will serve as the industry representative to this committee. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees, and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all related industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as the consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. The industry guest speaker for today's meeting is Dr. David Greenberg, Global Senior Expert Medical Strategy, Vaccines, Sanofi, Swiftwater, Pennsylvania. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers, guest speakers, and responders follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind members, consultants, and participants that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the conflicts of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to Dr. El Sabi. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Paydar. To kick us off, uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Weir, uh, Director of the Division of Viral Products at the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at CBER FDA. 
um, we'll go over introductions uh, to the meeting. Uh, 2024, Southern Hemisphere uh, Influenza Virus Vaccine Strain Selection. Dr. Weir. Thank you, Dr. El Sally. Uh, yes, I will give a just a very brief introduction to the meeting today and the agenda. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a brief summary of the, the agenda today. But after my introduction, you, you will hear uh, about global influenza virus surveillance and characterization. Uh, this is presented from the WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Control of Influenza, as we usually hear. But in addition today, we'll also have a discussion topic, uh, the title of which is Challenges and Opportunities for Vaccine Strain Composition with the Reduced Public Health Threat from Influenza B Yamagata Lineage Viruses. As part of that discussion, we'll hear short presentations from manufacturers' representatives, as well as an FDA perspective, and then we will follow with committee discussion and voting. Next slide. Okay, so the purpose of today's meeting. Uh, the first purpose uh, is to make recommendations for the strains of influenza A, both H1N1 and H3N2, and influenza B viruses to be included in the 2024 Southern Hemisphere formulation of influenza vaccines licensed in the United States. The reason for this is since 2016, we have had two U.S. vaccine manufacturers that have been approved to produce Southern Hemisphere formulations of their influenza vaccines. These are Sanofi Fluzone and Secura Sefluria. Both of these vaccines are quadrivalent and both of them are produced in eggs. Our procedure, our strain recommendation and supplement approval for Southern Hemisphere formulations follows the Northern Hemisphere process, and we use the most recent WHO recommendations as a guide. But in addition today, we're going to discuss the challenges and opportunities for vaccine strain composition with the reduced public health threat from influenza B Yamagata lineage viruses. Uh, the reason for this is kind of sort of twofold. One is that, as you'll hear probably later in the day several times, there have been no B. Yamagata lineage viruses been detected for over three years now. And our VRPAC, as the previous meetings of this committee, as well as WHO experts at the most recent string composition meeting, have advocated for vaccine composition changes that include removal of the B. Yamagata component, as well as con some consideration for other composition possibilities. Next slide. I want to spend the next two slides reminding you of what we've done recently and what's uh, been recommended most recently. So this committee last met in February, in March, uh, following the WHO recommendation for the Northern Hemisphere 2023-2024 season. In other words, the one we're in starting now. Uh, the WHO met on February 24th of this year. Our verb pack met a week and a half or so later, uh, once again, to consider the antigenic composition for the 2023-2024 2024 influenza season. The committee met, discussed, uh, made recommendations for influenza A H1N1, both for egg-based and cell and recombinant-based vaccines, did the same for H3N2, uh, also egg-based and cell and recombinant-based vaccine recommendations, and the committee discussed influenza B uh, for trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines, recommending a B Austria uh, 1359417 2021-like virus, and finally uh, uh, discussed the influenza B uh, for quadrivalent vaccines containing a B Phuket virus. Next slide. Most recently, uh, the WHO met about last week, actually, uh, to make recommendations for the Southern Hemisphere 2024 season. In other words, next summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, next winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the recommendation was published on 929 last week. And in that recommendation, they recommended that trivalent egg-based vaccines for use in the Southern Hemisphere contain the following an A Victoria 4897 2022 H1N1 PDM09 like virus, an A Thailand 8 2022 H3N2 like virus, and a B Austria 1359417-2021 B Victoria lineage viruses. In other words, there was one change here from the previous Northern Hemisphere, and that was in the H3N2 recommendation. 
Uh, the committee recommended that the B. Yamagata lineage component of the quadrivalent influenza vaccines remains unchanged from previous recommendations, and that was a B. Phuket 3073-2013 Yamagata uh, lineage spike virus. But after that recommendation, the WHO made another statement. The WHO Influenza Vaccine Composition Advisory Committee expressed the opinion that, quote, inclusion of a B. Yamagata lineage antigen in quadrivalent influenza vaccines is no longer warranted and that every effort should be made to exclude this component as soon as possible. And as you can imagine and see, that will be sort of the basis of some of our discussions today. Uh, next slide. Okay, so today we will have a, both a discussion topic and voting questions, and you'll see these later in the day, but I'm going to flash them up now so that uh, you can get a preview. The discussion topic for the committee, we're going to ask the committee to please discuss possible changes to the antigen composition of future seasonal influenza vaccines specifically the advantages and disadvantages of retaining the B. Yamagata lineage component in the quadrivalent influenza vaccine. Also, we will ask you to discuss the timing for possible removal of the B. Yamagata lineage component from current quadrivalent formulation, as well as to discuss opportunities and challenges for alternative vaccine composition formulations and the data needed to support such changes. Uh, following what I anticipate to be a robust discussion, we will have voting questions. These are shown on the next slide. We have three voting questions planned. The first one is, does the committee recommend excluding the B. Yamagata lineage antigen component from quadrivalent influenza vaccines as soon as possible? Second voting question will be for the composition of egg-based trivalent 2024 Southern Hemisphere formulations of influenza vaccines. Does the committee recommend, and we're lumping all three of these together since these were the egg, recommend, egg vaccine recommendations from WHO, uh, an inclusion of an A. Victoria 4897 2022 H1N1 PDM09 like virus, inclusion of an A. Thailand 8. 2022 H3N2 like virus, and the inclusion of a B Austria 1359417-2021 B Victoria lineage like virus. And the third question we will ask the committee is for quadrivalent 2024 Southern Hemisphere formulation of influenza vaccines, does the committee recommend the inclusion of a B Phuket 3073 2013 B Yamagata lineage like virus as the second influenza strain in the vaccine? Next slide. That concludes the introduction, and I'm happy to take clarifying questions. But before I do, I want to make one quick comment about our next speaker, Dr. David Wentworth. Um, as most of you on the committee know, Dr. Wentworth has been serving as the director of the WHO Collaborating Center in Atlanta uh, for several years, and he's been making these presentations about flu uh, vaccine composition, uh, at least since 2019. This will probably, I think, will be his last uh, VERPAC presentation in that capacity uh, because of his appointment recently as the Director of Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division at CDC. So, on behalf of the FDA and for me personally, I want to thank David for all of his contributions. Uh, David has done a remarkable job of taking an enormous amount of data uh, that the WHO sifts through for over a week and condensing it into a form that is easily explainable to all of us in about an hour. And that's no small feat. And I think he's done a great job over the years of doing that routinely and making all of this understandable for us. So anyway, I would like to thank him personally, as well as from the FDA for all he's done for us. I know the committee will thank him as well when he gives his talk, but on behalf of the FDA, I'd just like to say thank you, David. And now I'll take clarifying questions if there are any. Over. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Weir. Uh, Dr. Portnoy has a question. Dr. Portnoy, please unmute yourself and go on camera, please. Great, great. thank you. I, I don't see myself, but if there may be a delay. Um, I, under, I understand that we're going to be having these three voting 
questions, but the Yamagata strain has been a controversy for quite a while now. The committee has expressed its discomfort. If the committee votes no, will will there just simply not be a quadrivalent vaccine, or will the Yamagata be put in there as a placeholder anyway, given that there's probably not enough time to come up with a, a different virus? What happens if we vote no? Actually, I probably can't give you a final answer today. Uh, obviously, it's complex, and as you will hear from the manufacturers, we're pretty far. They will be. They will probably tell you they're pretty far along into preparing for a southern hemisphere vaccine. But regardless, we will listen to what the committee says, and we will take that under advisement and try to formulate a plan that is both practical and useful for the Southern Hemisphere. But I do think it is important, once again, to get a sense of the committee of how, of how they feel about this and especially what they think about timing. So I, I can't give you a final answer today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Question from Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you. I just had a quick question. I was wondering um, the choice of words as soon as possible. Is there a sense of urgency here that uh, suggests that we should include that in this question? Okay, so I can partially answer that. The way we have worded the question for you is verbatim from the way the WHO put it in their statement. Uh, you're right. The words as soon as possible are somewhat open to interpretation depending on whom you ask. Uh, that is part of the reason why in our discussion we have specifically asked you to weigh in on timing. So, yes, it is a little ambiguous, but that's the reason we worded it exactly the way the WHO did. Thank you. I see there are no additional questions for Dr. Weir. Uh, so we will move to the next part of the presentation, um, the agenda today, uh, whereby we will learn about the global influenza of uh, virus surveillance and characterization from Dr. David Wentworth, whom no one asked us to vote whether he can be relieved from informing us on the on the flu surveillance each year. Uh, so we want to thank him and uh, we will miss him quite a bit. Uh, Dr. David Wentworth is still currently the director of the WHO uh, Collaborating Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology and Control of Influenza and director of Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, uh, CORVD at the CDC. Dr. Wentworth. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much. I'm gonna dive in. We have quite a bit to cover, but I'll explain, I'll go through, fast through a few parts of it um, based on what Dr. Weir already described to you. So the outline of the presentation today is one thing I haven't done in the past is just dive right into the, all the deep molecular details. And um, I, I thought about it a bit and think that now that we have a public meeting and there's a lot more lay people watching it, it's pretty unfair. So I'm going to level set with a bit of overview on influenza viruses and the vaccine antigen selection process. And then I'll dive into the WHO composition meeting real quickly and then the, the selected information supporting the committee's, the WHO uh, vaccine consultation committee's recommendations on the, the viruses Jerry mentioned. So there's four different groups of influenza viruses that infect humans. And so they're very different uh, viruses from each other and they have very an different antigenic properties. And that's why we have a quadrivalent or a trivalent vaccine. Um, so there's two uh, species of alpha influenza viruses, the H3N2 and H1N1 PDM09. So H3N2 came into our population in the pandemic in 1968 and has existed with us ever since. And the H1N1 came in, as its name implied, in the pandemic in 2009 and has been co-circulating with H3N2 viruses. Then we had the B. Victoria and B. Yamagata viruses. These split from an original progenitor virus in the 80s. Uh, and, and kept diverging away from each other. And they're in the beta influenza virus species. And as that, Dr. Weir mentioned, we haven't detected a B. Yamagata since March of 2020. 
Um, the major antigens that we spend a lot of time talking about in this meeting, particularly the hemagglutinin or HA, is the virus attachment protein. And then um, antibodies induced against that protein uh, neutralize virus infection. And they also uh, kill virally infected cells through a process called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So these, these antigenic sites that are highlighted in light blue here, those are targets where the most potent antibodies against the virus uh, bind. And so these are neutralizing epitopes. And so when we're uh, immunizing folks with vaccines, we're trying to get high, uh, high level of antibodies into these neutralizing epitopes that will be very potent. We always get polyclonal responses to other parts of the HA that uh, can uh, neut neutralize a virus by killing virally infected cells, for example, and also through other things like opsonization, et cetera. So the neuraminidase plays a, plays a complete opposite role to the hemagglutinin. So the hemagglutinin binds to the cell surface and the neuraminidase actually cleaves the cell receptor, uh, surface receptor that the virus binds to and allows the virus to exit uh, infected cells. It plays other roles, but that's its major role. And so antibodies against this protein block that activity, or some subsets of them do, and antiviral drugs such as oseltamivir block or inhibit this protein. The genome itself is 13.5 kilobases in length, so it's a rather small genome. It's eight segments of negative sense RNA. And so you can see actually each of the segments in this thin layer uh, microscopy here done from Dr. Kowoka's lab. Uh, that, that enables reassortment during co-infections. And so this is one thing um, in this virus, not too many human influenza virus, or not too many human viruses have a segmented genome and can have this process. Um, so this gives it tremendous evolutionary power. Um, because you can get uh, two different parental viruses go in, and there's a possibility of 256 genotypes that will come out of an infected cell. The viruses themselves survive at the edge of error catastrophe. So with every round of replication of influenza virus genome, the RDRP or RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is error prone. And on average, it makes one nucleotide mistake for every 10,000 uh, nucleotides copied. And so some consider that a disadvantage for the virus because it's really close to the threshold of extinction. Um, Really, the, the, there's very many defective viruses for every replication cycle. And by defective, I mean if, as, if an individual particle tried to enter a cell, it wouldn't be able to complete a replication cycle. But it has a lot of advantages with increased adaptability. Uh, variants are rapidly selected upon any evolutionary pressure. And um, it's a real evolutionary benefit to evade host immunity. And that's in part why we're here today. They rapidly evolve. These viruses rapidly evolve. They require continuous comprehensive virus surveillance, and it necessitates frequent updates to the vaccine. And to drive this point home a little bit, the influenza viruses exist as a population of minor variants. This is true even in an individual, and I uh, borrowed this from a review by Esteban Domingo quite a long time ago, but I really think it gets the point across. With RNA viruses, particularly viruses like flu and HIV that make a lot of errors, you have a population of viruses uh, in the millions of viruses that are infecting you and in your lungs and upper respiratory tract, et cetera. And upon pressure, particularly immune pressure for influenza viruses, particularly neutralizing antibody pressure, you can select for populations that escape that immunity. And there may be different, uh, different mutations that each have a way of escaping uh, the population immunity. So you get some relative size of groupings of, of various uh, groups of virus that share certain mutations and can escape. And so that, that can happen intra-host, but it also happens when uh, we're transmitting the virus from one person to another. Um, when you're inhaling virus, you may have a lot of antibodies to all of these populations, and therefore you're just not infected. Or you may have antibodies to some subsets of the population and not others, and then it can be infected by those, and then that can be transmitted on the population scale to others. And this is how influenza really moves very rapidly through our population and rapidly adapts to uh, evade our immunity induced by natural infections and vaccines. So one of the goals and keys, key questions addressed for vaccine uh, antigen recommendations, these are the kind of uh, 
questions we're asking. So our goal is really to identify antigens that will elicit immunity against diverse or diverging viruses that will likely co-circulate in the future. These antigens, the ideal ones, confer breadth of immunity to match multiple lineages of viruses and therefore reduce the risks because we know many uh, viruses will co-circulate in the future. And one of the misnomers is that we're trying to match a strain that will circulate six months from now. And that's not really true anymore. We are not trying to match just one strain that will circulate. We're trying to look for antigens that have breadth, and we're trying to match that with fitness forecasting of the various uh, clades and subclades that are likely to co-circulate in the future. So uh, the goals of the committee really have changed over the years. Um, some of the key questions for the three to four viruses targeted by the different vaccines are, are or were there significant epidemics and where? What are the genetic subclades? And will we always spend quite a bit of time on that now that are, have emerged in our population? Are those new emerging variants spreading geographically? So are we seeing them in different countries and in different continents around the world? Um, are emerging variants anagenically distinct from prior or contemporary viruses? And that's the, one of the big questions for updating a vaccine. And what's the proportion of this new group and, and or groups and what groups are likely to predominate in the future? And do the current vaccines induce antibodies in humans? So this is where we get into a lot of this we can do with gen genomics and animal models. And, and then we need to look at how well vaccines that we're using now induce antibodies that protect against the various viruses. And then finally, if a new vaccine antigen is warranted, does it elicit antibodies with breadth, which recognize multiple important lineages? So does it confer breadth of protection? And um, this is the data we use, epidemiologic data, virus surveillance data, genomic characterization of the viruses, antigenic characterization of the viruses, post-vaccination human serology studies, vaccine effectiveness data. There's global consortium that shares data with us in interim ways, preliminary data before it's published, data integration and comparison among the WHO collaborating centers, uh, as well as other uh, reference laboratories and the availability and characteristics of new vaccine antigens. So that does it for the intro on flu and what we're trying to do. As Jerry mentioned, we met last week, uh, and this is really the vaccine consultation meeting for the Southern Hemisphere 2024. Uh, it's really, uh, the foundation of it is continuous surveillance of, of, that's conducted by the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, or GISRIS. Uh, and we need to thank all the WHO collaborating centers, the National Influenza Centers, the WHO Essential Regulatory Laboratories. That's what the ERL stands for. FDA is an example of one of those laboratories. WHO H5 Reference Laboratories. And they support the zoonotic uh, work that we do to also um, make vaccine recommendations for uh, pre-pandemic preparedness. And it's supported by more than 122 countries from around the world and 155 national influenza centers or so. The, the consultation meeting was held from the 25th to the 28th of December. It was a hybrid meeting. It was chaired by myself and Dr. Nicola Lewis from the Francis Crick Institute, pictured side of me there. Uh, 10 advisors, which are the directors of the WHO CCs and ERLs. And we have a disclosure of interest at the start of the meeting. There were 33 observers uh, and uh, participants, really, and experts from WHO, uh, regional offices and headquarters. And then we uh, had a public meeting with the manufacturers on the 29th of September, uh, going through a lot of the data in the same way. I'm going to go through it today, but in more detail on a couple of the viruses. So as Dr. Weir mentioned, these are the recommendations that we're dealing with. I have a multicolored slide compared to his, just to, to point out a couple of things. For trivalent egg-based vaccines, I won't walk you through the names. They're gonna be on the voting questions, but it's an A. Victoria virus. The reason this is highlighted in light blue is because you considered this last spring and it is the antigen that's in our vaccine this fall now that people are going to get now. Um, and so it was a recommendation uh, for the Northern Hemisphere already, and we're moving it up to that for the Southern Hemisphere 2024. So it's an update to the Southern Hemisphere, but it's the same as the Northern Hemisphere, and you've seen a lot of the data related to that decision already. Then there's the A Thailand 8, 
or in the cell or recombinant vaccines, the A Massachusetts 18 antigen. Um, these, rec these recommendations are updated both for the Southern Hemisphere for 2024 and in comparison to our current vaccine that we're getting uh, this fall for the fall and winter season. And then the B Austria component has stayed the same in both instances. And then we make recommendations for every licensed vaccine. And so there, the, there's licensed quadrivalent vaccines. And for that, even though there hasn't been any circulation of the B Yamagata, there's no reason to change that recommendation from the B Phuket 3073. We have no data that would indicate we need to update that. And as I'll go through some of the rationale that uh, Dr. Weir described about our, our statement, and this isn't a WHO statement, it's a statement from the Vaccine Consultation Committee about that it would be good to remove the B Yamagata component from uh, quadrivalent vaccines. So now this is a good slide just to indicate that we really have global surveillance and uh, sometime in, so any green uh, continent country listed, territory listed is sharing influenza viruses with WHO collaborating centers between this period of time. So there's many other countries sharing, but these were isolated between this period of time. And so it also has to do with where the activity was, but I will show you that individually um, later for each of the, um, subtypes and lineages. This slide's comparing the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. The boxed area is the region of time that we're uh, looking at viruses from. And so you can see in the Northern Hemisphere, we had a lot of H1N1, that's the light blue colors. It, the peak was more in April here. It was following the season, uh, the real big season here. Uh, in, in the end of uh, 2022 and beginning of 2023. And then we also had some B virus circulation as well, and it's continued at low levels uh, and still just continuing at very low levels. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, they had a, a pretty good season. This is now back to pretty much normal influenza seasonal levels. And you can see during their normal uh, seasonal timing, they had a lot of H1N1, again, the light blue, some H3N2, uh, which is in the kind of turquoise, and then the dark is unsubtyped. So proportionally, it'd be about the same. And then the same thing with B viruses and all the B virus lineage viruses tested were B Victoria, and I'll go into that later. So to tell you about the H1N1 viruses now, uh, here we have... Uh, these lines represent years from 2020 to 2023 and the number of H1N1 viruses detected by the GISRIS system. And so you can also just see when the seasonality is. And here in 2023, the red line we have beginning in week seven, uh, we start to see a rapid increase in the number of H1N1 viruses and then a, a, a decline and uh, a tail off as we move into weeks 34 and 35. This, this rapid dip down in 36 and 37 may be uh, not accurate because there's always a backfill of data uh, that would then make that maybe more flat. But either way, it's tailing off quite, quite considerably as a normal season does. Um, this slide shows you the activity by country um, uh, reporting to the GISRIS system, and it's based on the percent positive influenza specimens that are uh, detected. And so the light yellow colors are between 0.1 and 5% activity. And then as you get into the more intense orange colors, you increase to 10 to 20% activity, for example, or 20 to 30% activity. And so you can see some countries in, in Asia, in exam for example, China and other countries in Southeast Asia, uh, as well as some countries in Europe and, and some countries in South America had pretty strong activity. And many countries had the between the, the one to 5% type of activity happening. As I said, I'm gonna be brief. So I'm combining quite a bit of the detailed data into an overarching data. Here we have the overall H1N1 PDM09 HA phylogeography. We've talked about this. This is the phylogeny of the hemagglutinin. So it's the evolutionary tree of the hemagglutinin molecule. Uh, this large high level 50,000 foot view was provided by uh, Cambridge University, our colleague Sarah James and Dr. Derek Smith. Um, what we've labeled on here is the current uh, Southern Hemisphere recommendation, Sydney 5. It's in this group of viruses and, and Wisconsin 67 in this group of viruses. So this, this bar chart here to the left, uh, to, to the right of the tree, 
um, shows from 2021, 2022, and 2023, and each of the lines represent months of the year. And the color-coded tick marks represent which uh, continents the viruses have come from. And so you can see, you know, how the, how the virus is evolving and where uh, the different clades are co-circulating. And so there's still some geographic uh, kind of clustering of the clades, but you can see now a lot more admixture. For example, here you're seeing viruses in this major 5A2 clade, but they're in the subset, the 5A2A1, circulating in Europe, North America, South America, and a few tick marks here in Oceania, the pink colors for example. Uh, and then we've had a subsetting of, from the 5A2As. This was a major break off, this whole part of the tree. Those are the 5A2As. And so Sydney 5 is a 5A2A virus, and so is Wisconsin 67. Um, but a little bit of further evolution has happened in, in this group here, and they're called the 5A2A.1s. So it's a, a rather a, a subclade of this 5A2A, and that's the Wisconsin 67 virus. Now, when we look at the uh, these viruses using uh, ferret antisera, and then we take that data and uh, convert it to a visual illustration called antigenic cartography, which is shown here, we can see how uh, we can take a large set of data, lots of tables of individual tests, and display them here, easy for the human eye to kind of look at all the different viruses, and and to give you a sense of how these these cartographs work. Each of these gray squares that I hope you can see here represent a twofold difference between that virus and the homologous titer of its uh, of a parental uh, comparator virus. And so if you're within, say, for example, eight, eight fold, so eight of these squares, then we consider them really antigenically quite closely related. And as you get farther away from that, you start to become more antigenically distinct. Uh, just that's our kind of cutoff lines for definitional purposes. And so you can see all these clusters of viruses, whether they're the old Wisconsin 588-2019 virus that was the previous vaccine virus, or the Sydney 5 uh, cell virus here, these antigenically are very closely related using the model ferret anisera. And then the Wisconsin 67 virus is here, again, very close. And this circle around everything is how the serum from the Wisconsin 67-like virus, that represents the square here, reacts with all the viruses circulating. And so you can see by a ferret uh, immune response against these various antigens, this, this vaccine virus covers all of these viruses that are circulating. And the viruses that, that circulated prior to that are represented by this A Guangdong Mayo SWL 1536. So these are the 5A1 viruses. They're, they're way back up here in the evolutionary tree that I'm not showing anymore. But they show you how antigenically distinct the 5A1 and 5A2 viruses were from each other by ferret antisera. And so this kind of data doesn't support updating between these various vaccines. And we've discussed that in the previous meeting. So why are we doing it? And that really becomes, and I'll, I'll just, this gives you the, the summary of that data uh, in tabular form. All the tests done show that we see everything looks uh, quite good. 99% of the tests are reacting uh, in what we call well with viruses tested. So 99% of the viruses tested with anisera against Sydney 5 are reacting well. And that's also true for the egg cultivar of Sydney 5, 98% reacting very well. And this is where the post-vaccination human serology becomes very important. So here we're lucky because we even have our collaborating center in the Southern Hemisphere was able to get sera from the Southern Hemisphere vaccine, which included an update. The human serology data I showed you in the spring was using the older vaccine virus, Wisconsin 588. And so we saw more reductions in that sera. Um, if you recall, we saw a lot of reductions in this 5A2 group of viruses, and that helped support the update to the Wisconsin 67, which is in this 5A2A1. Now we're looking at sera with the 5A2A antigen, the Sydney 5-like antigen, from pediatric populations from Australia, adult populations that were given flu cell vax, the cell-based vaccine, or an egg-based vaccine, inactivated vaccine for quadrivalent uh, in Australia, as well as elderly greater than 65-year-old individuals in Australia. And so what um, you probably don't, can't see because you don't remember, but this these viruses, many of them were in the orange. So we're looking at 
Um, this is a statistical analysis of the data looking at um, whether or not the antigens would be, cons the vaccine might be considered inferior for antigens where as you get into the more uh, dark orange colors. And so you can see that the, this update to the 5A2A really worked well against a lot of different variants that uh, we selected uh, that were emerging and some of these in what we consider pretty important regions. Uh, this one was selected, it's a, it's a Washington 22-like virus. It's a very uh, infrequent virus. Very few of these have been found, but we selected it because of the particular changes that it has. And it did have some reduced reactivity, illustrating that the, the system works. However, this is not a virus we're super concerned about at the moment. Then we tested these 5A2A1 representatives, the Wisconsin 67, that's the cell-based vaccine for uh, this fall and winter season in the Northern Hemisphere, as well as Wisconsin 47, which is just like it, but it has one additional change that we're seeing in a lot of viruses. And what you can see is even with the update to the 5A2A, we're still seeing while the geometric mean titers are pretty good for the most part, uh, some centers like CBER and National uh, the NIID in Japan, we're having some reduced reactivity to these viruses. And collectively, that demonstrated that the, the changes in the site CA, which I didn't go belabor in the presentation, but these are consistent in these 5A2A1 proteins, subtly change the antigenic properties and reduce human antibody recognition, although the ferret antibody recognition still looks good. And so this is a pretty um, subtle change between these two viruses, but likely to uh, further improve the vaccine. With regard to the neuraminidase inhibitors, so antiviral susceptibility for H1N1 viruses, of over 5,000 viruses tested, only 18 showed resistance in genetic or phenotypic analysis studies. And with the endonuclease inhibitors, such as paloxavir, marboxol, um, of over 1,800 viruses tested, only two showed uh, su suggestions of resistance in genetic or phenotypic analysis. So to summarize the H1N1, Taken together, the committee felt the data supported updating from the Southern Hemisphere 2023 vaccine antigen, which was a Sydney 5 clade 5A2A for the hemagglutinin, uh, to the same antigen recommended for the Northern Hemisphere in 23-24, the Wisconsin 67, 2022-like HA clade 5A2A1, which just has those a couple of two amino acid differences between the two. Um, the H1N1 virus is circulated globally and predominated in most regions. A phylogenetics of the hemagglutinin uh, genes from viruses collected in this period showed nearly all were 5A2A. And so that recommendation really uh, was dead on with regards to what was circulating or they were 5A2A1 and that predominated in North America, Central America, and South America. While ferret antisera didn't distinguish between the various 5A2 clades, whether they were a 5A2, like an older Wisconsin 588 from 2019, or a 5A2A, like the Sydney 5 from 2021, or the 5A2A.1, like the Wisconsin 67 from 2022. However, the post-vaccination human series showed reductions in geometric mean titers associated with some of the substitutions in important antigenic sites, such as CA. Um, on the good news side, the interim vaccine effectiveness estimates from the Southern Hemisphere indicate that the vaccines were effective, and uh, it's consistent with uh, the a 5 uh, being in the vaccine. Nearly all the uh, viruses analyzed showed susceptibility to the antivirals. Oh, okay, we've got a hand raised. Dr. Offit. Uh, should we leave the questions till the end? It's up to you. I'll, I'll do it either way. Let's let's go with that. Sorry, Paul. Let's okay. Just, uh, do it that way. Thanks. Okay. So now to turn our attention to H three and two. Hang on a second. I gotta close my one of the windows that came up. Um, Again, you've seen this graph before. We're looking from 2020 to 2023. I'll focus on the 2023 period. Here we have January coming down from the Northern Hemisphere season with a brief lull and then an increase in H3N2 viruses, again, beginning around week seven and eight, uh, and then peaking around weeks 10 and 11 and dropping from there. And again, this sharp decline, I wouldn't uh, believe that. That's a, that's a data reporting issue. People are still reporting data from those timeframes. 
So influenza A, H3N2 activity globally, you saw this slide, I explained it before. Again, some of the regions where we had the bigger epidemics were in China um, and, and Norway, for example, and South Africa. And we saw some in uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, other areas. Um, but uh, many areas had the, the 0.1 to 5% circulation as well. So we had viruses from around the globe to analyze, but we are taking note of those locations that had uh, higher levels of activity. With regard to the overview of the H3N2 phylogeny, I've explained this tree before. So this is a tree going back to 2021 and into the present. The viral evolution, for the most part, is kind of going down the tree. Um, the Darwin-6, the current vaccine virus antigen, is shown its proximate location within the tree is in this group here. The tree breaks up at two sites. We had this major clade one and major clade two. These, I've, we've shortened the name from this long classification. If you've been following, these are the 3C2A1B, period 2A, period clade two. That's this number here, or they were clade one. And we've seen basically clade two viruses circulating everywhere. These have continued to evolve and break up into the clade 2B and 2A. And within the 2A group, we've had a lot of diversification happening. And I won't walk you through each of these names, but we will talk about some of them as we go. Uh, one of the major groups are currently circulating, so you can see in the months in 2023 here, being this uh, emergence of this clade 2A3A and the subgroup of that 2A3.1, 3A.1. So that's these viruses here. And you can see how they were previously circulating, maybe even initially in North America and Europe, and then uh, got into Asia and, uh, and, and Oceania and also back into Europe. So this is a little bit closer view of that tree. This is data produced by Dr. Condor's group in, in the CDC. Um, and so it's showing you the major recent clade two subclades. These are the two A, three A ones, which I just mentioned. An example of that subclade is this Massachusetts 18 recommended for the vaccine and the Thailand. So that's the cell-based and the Thailand eight, which is the egg-based vaccine. You can see their location in the tree here. That's why it's highlighted. Um, it's in the top of the tree in this bar that's blue represents the 2A3A1 uh, clade. And then um, the other groups that have been predominant, we had a lot of these viruses circulating in our season the last year, and even to a certain extent over the summer, the 2B viruses. These are more, more towards the bottom of this tree here, um, represented by the Florida 57 viruses, this yellow bar. And then the 2A1B virus is represented by the A Michigan 60 2022, well, which is right here and in this green bar here. So all of these viruses are here. Now, one thing I wanna point out and I've highlighted in light blue is the parallel evolution. So this recurrent evolutionary change from multiple uh, subclades within the tree um, from an isoleucine at position 140 to a lysine or a methionine, and the lysine is more frequently occurring. And so you can see that in the 2B viruses, a number of them now have this 140K substitution. You can also see that in the 2A1B viruses where nearly all of them have the 140K substitution. And in the 2A3A viruses, um, where they have the I140K substitution. This group here with the I140M represented uh, more by this Georgia 19 virus has declined uh, since its emergence uh, previously. Now, this is an integrated phylogeographic tree. So the tips of the tree are colored by um, the country or the country, the region where the viruses were isolated, for example. And so you can see uh, the more recent H3N2 activity happening in Asia, you can see a lot of these viruses were isolated in that part of the world, both in uh, East Asia and in China, for example, as well as in India with the more bright orange. So you see some patching based on the geography still, and then some admixing here. You can see the multicolor of this group of viruses, you know, in North America and Asia and Europe, et cetera. Now, if we go to the far right where these tick marks are, that's February 2023. So this time frame that we're interested in all the way to August 2023. 
Um, and of course, we have reduced numbers to look at at that time point for the same reason. Sometimes there's a drop off in activity and there's a backfill that will happen there over the next months. But we have really strong data up into July, for example. And so you can see where these guys have been circulating again based on the tick marks and a little bit of the movement of the viruses. But in uh, Oceania, these light pink viruses, for example, light pink dashes, uh, and in India and uh, in China, we're seeing a lot of these 2A viruses. Whereas the 2B, we've seen more in Europe previously, and now they, we're starting to see some of those. Uh, in India and, and China and, and uh, Oceania. And then uh, the 2B viruses down here, again, similar pattern uh, with more of those in South America and Brazil, for example. Okay, the final piece of this tree that I wanna show you is the reactivity pattern of ferret anisera against, um, so ferret anisera produced with the Darwin 6 2021 cell-like recommendation against various representatives from across this phylogeny. So we look for viruses that are representative of the base of that phylogeny, as well as some of the odd viruses that have unique amino acid changes within that particular subcluster. And we select those for antigenic analysis. And that's detailed here in these two uh, columns with less than eightfold reductions uh, shown on the left-hand column, and then color-coded by whether or not they were less than fourfold or between four and eightfold, or then if they were greater than eightfold into 16 and 32, they're going to be in the next column over. So the older clade, the 1A, the clade 1, it, it's subgrouped into this 1A.1 virus. You can see that clade isn't reacting well with the ferret anisera to the Darwin 6. But if you cast your eye up this column, you can see that most of the uh, anisera is showing good reactivity across all of these viruses, um, with some reductions seen more in the 2B viruses than in most of the other viruses along the, the phylogeny, uh, and a little bit of a reduction in one of the 2A3 viruses there. So that's a way to integrate the antigenic data that I'm going to show you next with, you know, on top of the phylogenetic evolution of the hemagglutinin. This shows you where the clades that I just described were circulating. And again, the primary clades circulating were these 2A3A1s and the 2Bs, for example, uh, with a few, uh, a little fewer of the 2A1B. And so you can see there is geographic differences between what's circulating in Europe and North America. We had more of the 2B and the 2A1B viruses, whereas in Asia, they had more of the 2A3A1 viruses, and this includes Oceania as well. Um, and then you can see in South Africa, where they had a high influenza B epidemic, they had primarily 2A3A1 viruses circulating, for example. To give you an idea how this has changed from the previous vaccine selection period until now, this is an estimated global infections of H3N2 HA clades based on sequence data um, that is pulled down from the shared sequence databases that we all contribute to in near real time, and then estimated uh, to reduce the impact of sequencing bias. So different countries and different regions around the world produce different amounts of sequencing data. Uh, for example, North America and Europe, there's a lot of sequencing data produced per infection, you know, versus in other areas of the world. So to try to reduce that bias, we're multiplying the, the, the sequence data by the regional population size, assuming a 10% infection rate. And that's to try to level the playing field so that you can see um, real uh, increases or decreases. And so you can see we had all these different clades co-circulating. And again, the major clades were 2B, uh, 2A3A1, and 2A3A. And what we've seen in the more recent uh, time frame, uh, and this is shown at like about the 50 million bar mark is, is here, um, is a real change with a decrease in the 2A3A and a, a strong increase in the 2A3A1s, whereas the 2B have held fairly steady. We also look at both the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase uh, genetics. And um, we also look at, at a little bit at the neuraminidase antigenicity, particularly for H3 viruses. Here I'm showing you their phylogenies, but together so that you can see, remember influenza viruses can reassort. And so you can see how these two different genes are working together and in the evolution of the virus. And so on the left, I have a hemagglutinin, you haven't seen something like this before, I don't think, but we call this a tangle 
single gram. On the left, you have the HA for the H3N2 viruses over the past two years. And the tips are colored by something called local branching index or LBI. And that's a measure of the evolutionary rate of the different viruses. So it's one of the fitness forecasting measures that's used to look for viruses that may have increased evolutionary fitness compared to other clades. And I've pointed out on here where the 5A2A.1, the, the base of these 5A2A viruses sit. This is one of the reasons Darwin 6 has been such a good vaccine candidate is it really sits close to these uh, this whole group of viruses here that are circulating as well as these 2B viruses circulating. Um, and here's the Darwin 9. And so the light colors suggest low levels of, of local branching index. And as you get into the warmer colors, you get a higher levels of local branching index. And so what you can see on the hemagglutinin side is that um, the 2A3A1s have the highest uh, LBI. And then uh, when we look at the NA, now we're going towards 2023 from the right to the left. You can see that's also true for the NAs. Those viruses that are paired or correlated with the HAs from the 2A3A1, those NA genes and those viruses tend to be associated here and are also undergoing uh, have higher local branching index. So it appears, you know, these two genes have to work together. One binds, the other releases. And so they do co-evolve and the NA often trails uh, the hemagglutin in a little bit. So here's showing you the changes of the key serology antigens that we tested and really the difference between the Darwin 6 cell-based uh, vaccine antigen and the Massachusetts 18 cell-based vaccine antigen. And I'm showing you here with no amino acid substitutions at Darwin 6. There's a lot of them compared to previous viruses, but I'm showing you as a blank slate. It's color-coded by the major antigenic epitopes, antigenic sites on the hemagglutinin. So this peach color is antigenic site B. The green color is antigenic site A. Uh, the, the light blue color, antigenic site D. And the yellow color, antigenic site E. And then the dark kind of purplish blue, antigenic site C. The receptor binding pocket, binding site is circled here. So it kind of sits in a pocket between antigenic site A and B. And these antigenic sites generate the, the neutralizing antibodies that have the, the most potency against the virus. So they really are good at blocking the virus receptor interaction and therefore blocking uh, entry of the virus into a cell. So the virus can, can't even get into a cell to start replicating, and that's why they're so potent. Um, with the Massachusetts 18, we have this I140K that I highlighted in the tree that's been evolving in multiple clades. The 2B virus is having it, the, the 2A3A virus is having it, uh, and the 2A3A1s, which are, are increasing in proportion, having it. And then they also have this N96S, so the asparagine to a serine at 96. The reason this is starred is it introduces a potential glycosylation site at asparagine uh, number 94. So amino acid 94 would be right over here. So you can see both of these are really closely located to each other. The, the 140K is in site A and the, the, the N96S is more closer to site E. But either way, they're an important antigenic sites. We have some other substitutions we consider these. These have been a, uh, around for quite a bit in different branches of the tree and maybe kind of minor. When we rotate this molecule 180 degrees, you can better see this I192F, so an isoleucine to a phenylalanine. That's a rather big amino acid change right in the top of antigenic site B. So that's what's been evolving. And then when we look at antisera, as I already alluded to in our overlaid phylogeography that also included antigenic information, um, the CDC, we were seeing really good reactivity with antisera to the Darwin 6-like viruses with all the viruses we had to look at across the phylogeny. So 100% of our viruses were reacting very well with this Darwin 6 cell-like antigen. We saw a little reduction with the Darwin egg. But if we go down to, for example, the Chinese National Influenza Center, a collaborating center in China, you can see they had a lot of viruses to look at. And a lot of these were the these 2A3A one viruses, and they had a pretty considerable reduction in the number of viruses that were considered uh, reacting very well with the current vaccine and had some that were reduced to the current vaccine. Uh, this was also a little bit evident with the vidral in China, or I mean in uh, Australia, sorry, that's our Australian collaborating center. 
Whereas the CRIC and the CDC, so uh, the UK and the US had a pretty similar reactivity patterns. Um, again, we see a very similar pattern with the egg. We often see a little bit of a reduction with the reactivity of egg antigens, particularly in the H3 viruses. So that is not surprising. Now, this shows you a detailed, one detailed hemagglutination inhibition test done by our colleagues uh, at Vidral. And it's showing you a previous vaccine antigen, the Cambodia EO823660. I had a homologous titer of 640. And so what we're really doing is comparing that homologous titer with the viruses that we're testing. And so you can see there's a huge difference you know, more than eightfold difference between Darwin 6 and this Cambodia. And you can see if we hadn't updated to Darwin 6, this wouldn't be reacting very well with any of the viruses that are co-circulating in this time frame. here. You can see viruses from Sydney, Auckland, Singapore, uh, a lot of Australian viruses, because this is from that collaborating center, Philippines. Um, very, the color coding here is showing eightfold in the orange and greater than eightfold in the reds. Whereas the Darwin 6 here and the Darwin 9 egg uh, are reacting well, 1280 homologous titer, 640 only twofold, and then 320 fourfold. So you get these color coding here with the light colors. But really, the cell antigen reacting still pretty well to most of these viruses. But we are starting to see some reductions with some of these 2A3A1 viruses. Their clade is listed over here. Um, uh, with the Darwin egg candidate. And then if we look at this Thailand 8 cell, which ma really matches the Massachusetts cell recommendation or the Thailand 8 egg uh, virus, we're seeing better reactivity with all the viruses that are co-circulating with the exception of this Brisbane 273 down there at the bottom here, which is the 2A1B clade that we haven't seen an expansion of and rather a little bit of a contraction of that clade. All right. So we can take all that data, multiple uh, HI tests like that, and I already showed you cartography before, and layer them into antigenic cartography. At CDC, we do something called high contrast imaging neutralization test, or HINT. And this is a very granular assay. It's a little more sensitive than hemagglutination inhibition. Uh, and, and it's pretty similar to this fluorescent reduction assay. So this is also a cell-based neutralization assay done by Vidral, a CC at Melbourne. So, but what we're beginning to see is um, while these are antigenic related viruses, their clades are listed here and color coded here. Again, the major clades being this 2B in the brown, um, then 2B with a particular change that we've been watching. There's very few of these viruses around, but we tested quite a few of them, T135A in this light blue, and then um, the 2A3A1, which are this green coloring here. Uh, and then uh, the 2A1B are the more brown colors. And just to, to try to be a little bit briefer here, what we're seeing is there's a little bit of segregation and grouping between each of these now clusters. They used to be a little more admixed. Um, the gray dots, I should have mentioned, are older viruses that were tested outside of this period. So you can still see these are antigenically very related with the ferret antisera, which works well, again, for antigenic relationships of uh, H3N2 viruses. But they're starting to kind of diverge and spread apart and form their own small clusters. They still are very different than the previously circulating viruses that were the previous vaccine sat. And so here we're showing you this, this data from Melbourne, you know, different people doing different, uh, the same, the similar assay um, with different viral antigens and some of the same antisera. And so you can see that the Dar Darwin 6 uh, cell and egg pairs are here and where they sit. And they saw a lot of these uh, 2A3A1 viruses in the green and that the Thailand cell and egg are, are well positioned to cover those. If we add the serum circles, so this is now looking at antisera against, uh, this is done from the CCN Melbourne against the Thailand 8 cell. You can see how that sera now covers all these uh, newer 2A3A1s a little better than the Darwin 6 uh, would have, but it's going to lose some of these older viruses and particularly like the 2B. And so this becomes the challenge. You know, you have a one that's a little bit more broadly cross-reacting, but um, the, the, the phylogeny and the evolution of the virus is moving towards these 2A3A1 viruses. 
And then again, this is showing you the Darwin six uh, serum circle and how many of these are, are, are the Darwin nine uh, egg serum circle and how many of these two A301s are no longer being covered. And even some of the two Bs are being covered as well. Okay, now let me tell you about the human serology. This is showing you the individual human serum analysis. I'll also show you a compilation next, but sometimes it's helpful to see this individual serum analysis. I'm only showing you the adult panel from Australia at the moment, just to get the points across. The, the size of the circles that you're seeing kind of listed in the column go from one uh, serum tested to 25 with the largest circle. And so that gives you a bit of a key. And this is looking at their pre-vaccination sera. So we collect sera prior to their vaccination and then their post-vaccination sera on the right in the orange. So pre is blue, post is orange. And here we're looking at uh, the Darwin-6. So it's the kind of the homologous antigen to what was in their vaccine. It's not the exact antigen that was in their vaccine because it may be Darwin-6 in the flu cell vax and Darwin-9 derived or similar in the egg-based vaccine, the IV4 quadrivalent. Flu cell vax is also quadrivalent. I should, should mention that. Um, Anyway, so you can see the geometric mean titer, which is where this gray bar is, we have listed as 11, and it bumps up to 205. And then the 24% is describing how many in this group had a titer greater than or equal to 40 prior to vaccination. So 24% had a titer, this is a 40, greater than or equal to 40. And 40 is a correlate of protection for influenza from influenza viruses. And so after vaccination, you can see we got a GMT of 205 with an 88% now having a titer greater than 40. And then now we look into the forward evolution of the viruses, looking at specific uh, serology antigens based on the clade. So the 2A1B, Michigan 60, the 2A3, which had these huge number of changes. So a very rare virus, but we wanted to know if this one has evolutionary potential. Uh, this Georgia 19. The 2A3A1, the base of that group, Massachusetts 18, a number of them, I didn't mention this when I was talking about the evolution of the 2A3A1, but a number of them are evolving this substitution asparagine 122 to aspartic acid, which results in the loss of the glycan. Um, and so that's represented by the New York 66. And then Florida 57 is the base of this 2B group. And we saw some of them having this change at 135, which impacts a potential glycosylation site. These have bigger impacts than just a single amino acid change. That's why we look at them. And then the I-142M representative, which really I didn't think was going to be too big of a problem. So what you can see is we have good uh, reactivity against the 2A1B, you know, we still have 147 geometric mean titer with 92% uh, above 40. And then we saw a good reduction here by this virus, this Georgia 19. So these uh, mutations are definitely impacting our reactivity, human serology reactivity uh, when they're immunized with the Darwin 6. The 2A3A1, on the other hand, we actually see pretty good neutralization of this group still. You know, 205 to 194 and N122D even was neutralized pretty well. Um, and as we saw a little bit more reductions with the clade 2B viruses, which circulated already in our hemisphere previously and are at the, at the moment flatlined, but I think on the decline. But this is, we actually had pretty good VE in our, in our system and we had a lot of these viruses. And so they had geometric mean titers in the 160, 121, 189. All right, uh, basically a similar pattern. I have it on here, uh, just so you can see with the egg-based vaccine, we have a very similar pattern reductions in this group, pretty good neutralizations of the 2A3A1 representatives and uh, subtle reductions in the 2Bs. This is now compiling that same kind of data from all the groups, both uh, WHO collaborating centers and essential regulatory laboratories that do uh, analysis of the post-vaccination human sera. Um, again, it's color-coded based on the likelihood or potential, um, it could be possibly inferior uh, vaccine to antigens that would be in the brighter orange colors. Um, and here we're looking at a larger number of serum panels from the pediatric. Now, this is from the Northern Hemisphere uh, vaccine, uh, these two top ones, as well as this 9 to 17-year-old group. And then the adult, and this is from the Southern Hemisphere vaccines, 
uh, this batch here all the way down. And so kind of the top part of the graph is Northern Hemisphere vaccines. We, we were one of the few groups that did the testing there just to look at what the virus is, how they're doing compared to Northern Hemisphere vaccine, and then the Southern Hemisphere down here. And so as, as you can see from those bubble plots, you know, the 2A1B representatives, these Michigan 60, they actually had some of the lowest reactivity patterns. And this 2A3 with all these substitutions really across uh, multiple centers, we saw that. Um, but in the 2A3A1, overall pretty good, but some centers, uh, such as CBER, seeing some reductions there, and MHRA in the UK, seeing some reductions in some of the serum panels uh, in the 2A3A1s. We also saw some reductions in the 2B. So I've bulleted here uh, just to bring the points home. The most significant reductions in the geometric mean titer or GMTs were observed in these 2A1B, the 2A3, and the 2B representatives. And there were fewer and more subtle rec uh, reductions in this uh, 2A3A1 clade viruses. With regard to the antiviral susceptibility, we're in really good shape. None of over 2,000 viruses were showing any resistance to the neuraminidase inhibitors and uh, of the over a thousand tested with the PA inhibitors, the endonuclease inhibitors, 10 showed genetic or phenotypic evidence of reduced susceptibility. So to summarize the H3, I know that was a lot of data. Collectively, the committee felt the data indicated that updating the vaccines to the Thailand 8, um, AH3N2 2022 like viruses for egg-based vaccines or Massachusetts 18, like viruses for the cell and recombinant uh, based vaccines for the Southern hemisphere was warranted. The H3N2 subtype predominated in some countries in areas and territories. Most H3N2 activity was observed in Southern Africa and in Asia. Um, phylogenetic analysis of the HA genes from virus in this period showed continued diversification of the clade 2A viruses. Their complete classification for those of you tracking is there. And whereas the 2B viruses have been more evolutionarily stable, but still circulate. The major clades circulating in this period now are 2A3A1, greater than the 2B, greater than the 2A1B. The clade 2A3A1 increased in proportion during this period and predominated where H3N2 activity and epidemics occurred. Uh, the ferret antisera to the Darwin 6, it recognized viruses expressing most of the HA clade 2 derivatives well. So we're still seeing a pretty good reactivity. That's a very good vaccine antigen with limited reductions uh, seen among viruses expressing the 2B and 2A1, 2A3A1 HA clades. And it was more pronounced with the Darwin egg antisera. The Massachusetts 18 cell or Thailand 8 egg uh, like antigens reacted well. So when they were given as, uh, to, as antigens to ferrets, that sera reacted well with most circulating viruses, particularly those expressing the 2A3A1 HA clade genes. And then overall, most of the human post-vaccination sera, which they were vaccinated with Darwin 6-like viruses, reacted well with most emerging lineages, including the 2A3A1. However, some recent HA clade 2A1B, 2A3A1, and 2B virus representatives were significantly reduced in some serum panels in some of the groups that were doing the testing. The interim VE... Um, from the Southern Hemisphere was very limited due to low circulation overall. And then nearly all viruses analyzed showed reduced susceptibility to antivirals. Okay, how are we doing on time? Getting late. So I'm going to move through part of the influenza B pretty rapidly. I, needed, I wanted to be sure to cover the H3 very well and detailed. Um, Again, this is the typical slide you've seen. Actually, in this period, we saw the increase of all three viruses around the same period of time. You can look at those. Um, here, beginning a little bit earlier, weeks four, uh, and tailing off by starting week 16 or so. Uh, for the influenza B viruses, this is where we saw activity. There was quite a, a bit of activity in the Americas, actually, in South America and Brazil and in Mexico and North America. Uh, and then in other parts of the world, you know, Northern Africa and Europe. We saw more activity. When we look at the, the lineages circulating of those tested, um, 
100% were B Victoria lineage and 0% were B Amagata lineage. We had 22% in this surveillance system. This is provided by the WHO Global Influenza Program through their flu serve net. Um, we're not determined, but the, that's much better than the past. A lot of the national influenza centers have been working hard to do lineage testing. So with regard to the influenza B vir Victoria viruses, um, this, I have to show you the, the, the phylogeny, but the good news is really the majority of viruses circulating to date are all these V1A, 3A2, I will call them 3A2 viruses for short. These are the amino acids that they have different from their predecessor viruses, or, or they're consistent among that clade. And the B Austria 1359417 from 2021 sits uh, kind of smack dab in the middle of that clade, a little bit to the south there. And here's our serology antigens that we tested, again, across the, the phylogeny, looking for differences that have specific amino acid changes in their clusters. Looking at ferret anisera to the B Austria, it's reacting well with everything we tested in the 3A2 uh, groups and their subgroups. Uh, and we only see reductions against the older clade three viruses. So they're the progenitor of these 3A2, and they're represented by the, the Washington 2 virus that used to be in our vaccine. You probably can't see it there. Um, this is culminating of all the antigenic analysis. Greater than 99% of the viruses are reacting very well with anisera to the B. austria cell-like virus, and very similar for the egg candidate. So uh, not a lot of signals here to change the vaccine. The B Victoria antigenic cartography, I've even overlaid the circum serum circles right away to uh, save time. But you can see where the egg and cell, egg shaped like an egg and cell shaped round and larger than their counterparts are circulating. I didn't point out on the tree, I will really quick, um, we have a lot of viruses with this 197E substitution. It's a pretty small change from an aspartic acid to a glutamic acid. And we wanted to understand whether or not that was making an antigenic impact. You can see the color coding here, the light, light green, the base, and the more olive color with the 197E add mixing and covered well by the antisera. And that's also true uh, with, so this is data from London and data from Melbourne. Again, with the B human serology, the post-vaccination post human serum analysis with the B Victoria viruses, many different 3A2 viruses were tested with different amino acid substitutions, all reacting very well with the post-vaccination human sera. And the 1A3 viruses, which are older, represented by like Washington 2, you can see a clear distinction now between these two, although there still is some memory response, for example, as you get older, um, where they have a geometric mean titer of 135, the memory response is still boosting uh, to 72 in those Washington 2 group. Uh, so that's, that's always important to note. Uh, we don't see that in the young kids, of course. Um, with the B Victoria lineage antiviral susceptibility, it's here over 2,000. Sh only six showed high, uh, evidence of highly reduced inhibition, and five of these had this particular change, K360E. We like to point those out for people that are really interested in uh, inhib inhibition or resistance to inhibitors. And then of the endonuclease inhibitors of over 1,300 B Victoria lineage viruses looked at in this period, zero showed evidence of reduced susceptibility. So now to the B Yamagata. There were, as Dr. Weir mentioned at the outset, there have been no confirmed detections of B Yamagata circulating since after March of 2022, or 2020, pardon me. And this coincides with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The, um, of the over 15,000 influenza B viruses collected between this uh, February 1st and, and August 31st, this, this time frame that we're interested in, and lineage tested, no B Yamagata lineage viruses were confirmed. Now we periodically see from one of the national influenza centers or other places around the world, the potential detection of initially identified as a B Yamagata lineage. And so these will pop up. Um, each of the collaborating centers that work with the various national influenza centers will reach out and, and get the viruses to, for secondary testing and confirmation. 
And so of those, 13 were confirmed to be B vectorial lineage viruses or were just negative for influenza B overall, and two were not available for confirmation. So the, the specimen was all gone and did not yield a sequence data or virus isolates at the location they were originally identified in. Uh, the absence of the confirmed detection of naturally occurring B. Yamagata lineage viruses is indicative of very low list risk of infection by B. Yamagata lineage viruses in humans. Um, it was the, our opinion as the WHO Vaccine Co Composition Advisory Committee that while both trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines remain safe and effective, the inclusion of the B. Yamagata lineage antigen in quadrivalent influenza vaccines is no longer warranted. And every effort should be made to exclude this component as soon as I put in here practically possible. Um, and we can discuss that. But basically, the, as soon as possible was meant to be, we know there's different cadences for different manufacturing processes and um, the fact that the committee recognizes national and regional authorities are responsible for approving the composition and formulation of vaccines used in each country and should consider the, the use and relative benefits of trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines. So we understand that at number one, we're supposed to make recommendations for what's licensed. And so we make a recommendation for tri and quadrivalent vaccines, but we also wanted to make this point that we don't think at this point in time it's warranted. It's very difficult to determine if B. Amagata lineage viruses are really extinct. And so the as soon as possible is meant to say with both what needs to happen for manufacturing and quality control and for approval in the regulatory authorities, this isn't something you do in one day. Um, so influenza B virus summary, the only influenza B Victoria was available for analysis. Collectively, there was not evidence that updating B Vic uh, vaccine antigen from B Austria was needed. Uh, I think you could see that quite clearly, even though I went through it rather rapidly. The phylogenies of the hemagglutinins show that they vastly predominate. They have global dissemination, so they're really fit viruses. It, but while they continue to diversify, um, Antigenic distinct viruses expressing the progenitor clade 1A3 and 3A1 genes continue to decline. So all these viruses were antigenically related, and that's shown in the next bullet. Um, and post-vaccination human antisero analysis did really well against these uh, viruses. Also, the interim vaccine effectiveness estimates from the Southern Hemisphere, which had quite a bit of influenza B circulation, indicate that the vaccines were highly effective. Uh, in this period. And nearly all the viruses analyzed showed susceptibility to antivirals. And as Dr. Weir mentioned at the outset, um, it's, it's my last uh, VRPAC presentation. I want to thank you, the committee, for your intense deliberations and for really being able to follow my hurried presentations that try to compile a week's worth of information into an hour. Uh, you follow it extremely well and ask really impressive questions to me. Um, Dr. Condor, who's been the, the deputy director of our WHO Collaborating Center for uh, as long as I've been the director, is now going to be serving as the acting director, and I want to introduce you to her. She is responsible for a lot of the beautiful phylogenetic analysis and integra data integration you see in these presentations. And with that, I have my disclaimer, and I'll stop. Thank you. As I'll always, stop sharing. A, a tour de force, Dr. Wentworth, as always, walking us through a very complicated data set with a lot of certainties and uncertainties. Yeah. Uh, we have the first question from Dr. Offit. Please uh, unmute and go ahead. Yes, thank you. So, so uh, David, so thank you for that very thorough presentation. I, I, I'm trying to understand this virus. So, so when we talk about flu, what we talk about is we talk about the evolution of the hemagglutinin or neuraminidase away from antibody recognition. 
So my question to you is, do T cells play any role in protection against this disease? Because presumably the T cell recognition sites, whether it's CD4 or CD8 positive cells on these A proteins are, if it's true, but similar to other viruses are fairly well conserved. So you would think that there wouldn't be the kind of strain to strain variation that we see with regard to antibody recognition. Do T cells play a role? Or said another way, if you had, let's say you just had a nuclear protein vaccine, which will have T cell recognition sites, would that in any way be effective in preventing this disease? Thank you. Yeah, so T cells are important. I don't want the immunologist friends of mine to tell me that I'm, you know, bashing T cells, right? So they're critical. And and even for antibody help, and you know all this, Dr. Offit, you know, just to get uh, the right antibodies made, you need good T cell recognition in some ways. The issue is with influenza is its speed. So as a negative strand virus, it's poised to replicate almost as soon as it uncoats inside the cell. And I I don't want to get into the deep virology of it, but it carries all its replication machinery into the cell with it. So within six hours of infecting a cell, it's already producing progeny virion. And within overnight, uh, an individual is now uh, basically having millions of viruses in their respiratory tract, and they're obviously expanding logarithmically. And then you're transmitting influenza often before you even feel sick. Um, and so where the T cells become most important, particularly CD8 T cells, killing T cells, is clearing the infection. You know, so they, they are very important clearing the infection. But if you think about the evolution of the virus, it's a lot, uh, and they do impact the evolution of the virus. I don't mean to say that they don't, but influenza has really gone in, done its damage, and transmitted before T cells can really have a huge impact. Remember, they're going to take out virally infected cells, and they may be resident in your in your uh, respiratory airway at some level, but not at the level needed to really protect you. And and so. The primary driver of influenza influenza evolution is the ability to escape those neutralizing antibodies, likely antibodies that are really IgA antibodies in the mucosal surface, right? But um, then it's come in, done its damage, and often transmitted to many other people. Now, the sooner T cells come in, they can actually reduce that transmission to other people in the later stages of infection. And so there is evolution at T cell epitopes that we see. But if I were to show you that on the same tree as I show you a hemagglutin and evolution against neutralizing antibodies, the time scale is so different. Like it's like a 10 year period and you can start to see key epitopes in nucleoprotein, as you mentioned, start to be uh, have an evolution impacting them. So I, from my perspective, I think that is saying that they do matter. They clearly matter for clearance because Folks that have uh, immunodeficiencies with T cells have trouble clearing influenza virus. Um, And and that the sooner you can clear the virus, the less likely you are to transmit it in the later stages of infection. And that's how it impacts the evolution of the virus. But when we focus on the the thing that has the fastest impact on the virus is the neutralizing antibodies to the HA, then to the NA. So when we focus the vaccine selection more on the HA, we're really picking the, the, the tip of the spear of influenza evolution. And so by moving with that tip, you're often updating T cell epitopes, you know, unbeknownst to you, really. So, so thank you, David. Just one quick follow-up question, if you don't mind, Hannah. So, so if you look at, for example, work by uh, Daniel Corey and, and others in Australia, as well as T-cell immunologists here regarding SARS-CoV-2 infection, it does look like CTLs do play a role in protection against serious disease. And there is, at least for SARS-CoV-2, you know, fairly conserved T-cell recognition sites. So are you saying that influenza is different then than SARS-CoV-2 in terms of its rapidity? Because it, it, in my understanding anyway, it, regarding CTLs is that, that you know, the virus enters the cell very quickly, the, the proteins are broken down, and then, then these eight to 15 more peptides are put on the surface in conjunction with class one glycoproteins in an hour. And then, in theory, right. you know, help me, kill me, I'm infected with this virus. And then CTLs play a role. Are you saying that it, it's that those two viruses are different then in terms of how quickly CTLs can make a difference? No, I think they're very similar from that perspective. And and you, if you look at the evolution of SARS, it's actually kind of similar to flu. SARS-2 with the, the mutations in the spike being really predominant, whereas nucleocapsid of SARS having very few uh, 
you know, changes. And again, nucleocapsid would be highly targeted. You know, the whole genome is highly targeted by T cells. So I think it's the same story. If you were to say protect from serious disease, which is what you said for SARS, that's true for flu as well. Okay, then you're protecting from serious disease. And what I was driving at is what's driving the evolution of the virus is, you know, the viruses aren't trying to cause serious disease, right? To anthropomorphize them a bit. They're trying to spread and make more of themselves. And so the best way to do that is to get into another person and infect that other person, right? And so even for SARS, you're seeing the primary evolution happening in the spike at regions where neutralizing antibodies uh, impact SARS. So you're saying then that, that if I'm infected with a flu strain and then the following year, a different flu strain, um, that, that I am to some extent protected by against serious disease because of those cross-reactive CTL recognition sites. As the yes. Never been exposed. Thank you. That answers my question. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I appreciate it. And but but vaccination would also likely increase the resident CTLs in tissue resident CTLs in your in your respiratory tract. So it it offers a, still a benefit from that from a T cell perspective. Thanks, David. And good luck in your future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, thank you for that terrific presentation, um, as, as always, and, and uh, for, for all the presentations you've given. Um, and congratulations, I think, on the new job. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I have a question about uh, B. Yamagata. And because uh, you seem to be raising the question of whether or not it was truly extinct at the end. Can you do modeling to tell you how deep your sampling has to be in order to, to measure a threshold at which you can give you a, a confident threshold at which you can determine whether or not Yamagata is really gone? Yeah, I mean, and this really gets outside of my area of expertise on the modeling piece, what you would need to do. What I will tell you is part of our thought process and discussions are, yeah, you could try to do this. And so, for example, I think Rinderpest would be a good, like if you really looked at how we determined Rinderpest was extinct, really good template for that. But it gets, it gets to a certain point of it's very hard to prove something's extinct, right? And what we do know is that where we've seen B virus epidemics, we have not seen B Yamagata. So it hasn't bubbled up to cause an epidemic. We would anticipate there, there would be outbreaks somewhere that really across the entire global influenza re, uh, surveillance spot system, the GISRIS, that we might pick up an outbreak, particularly in, say, for example, um, a, a school where, like an elementary school, where people may not have had any exposure to B. Yamagata in the past, you know, these children, um, and so where it could potentially bubble up. And so, the, what we started to settle in on is what's the real risk of being infected? Not, is it extinct? We don't, we can't know that right now. What's the real risk of being infected? And the real risk from a, you know, from our perspective is very low compared and, 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 and that's the fact. Now, if it were to reemerge, then we can react to that. Right. But, but standing around and really trying to do detailed studies to, to really prove something's extinct takes time. And, and, and that's, that's the conundrum we have, I think. We have the likely potential that it is extinct versus, you know, um, and, and acting now and doing more proactive things to further improve flu vaccine, open up um, antigen space for other viruses, for example, in flu vaccine. Uh, and we have the potential that it is extinct. And so why should we be... Um, growing up large quantities of virus, manufacturing and using a vaccine that could potentially reintroduce something that's likely extinct. And so that's the, I think that's what you have to weigh. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Dr. Shane. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you, David, for a lovely presentation, this one and, and others. So appreciated. And um, I really enjoyed the introduction as well. Um, my question actually relates uh, to Dr. Rubens. And I was just going to ask, you know, there was a percentage of B viruses that were not uh, being able to be identified. Is there any concern that those might be uh, Yamagata influenza B or, or not? Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we're always going to have that issue. And 
our concern was quite minimal on on their not being. So to just to better answer Dr. Rubin's question, one thing I do understand a little bit is trying to figure out what the level of predominance would be. And we actually have something called the rare event detection calculator on the website. It's part of our um, uh, our CDC, you know, calculations for how many viruses we want to survey, how much sequencing we want to do and all that. Um, it's called uh calculator B, and it's on the American Public Health Laboratory's website. Um, but if you if you think about it, if we had done those extra viruses, so that would only push us from 15,000 to 20,000. And so that's still not extensive enough to be super confident, right, that it's gone, mm -hmm. right? So it's re reducing your ability. So for, for example, with that number, we know it's likely less than 0.5 zero five percent of the viruses out there in that time window with 15,000 tested whereas you know if we do another five that's not going to really move that dial we need to do an order of magnitude more to get it to move one decimal place more basically and so it becomes a very costly thing and a very time consuming thing to try to do that and you would still just be well it's less than this probability thank you um, I have a question, um, and that's on your slides 34, 35, um, which, which, which sort of indicates that the Georgia strain is sort of the outlier in everything, right? Yeah, you're right. Um, and, and so that one and it was selected you know we, so we select these these antigens for serologic analysis long before we have the sera so we're looking across the phylogeny dr condor is very involved in this and we're looking to the ones that really look like they have mutations in what we know are key antigenic epitopes mm -hmm. and selecting those for analysis later. So we, um, and we have to grow them up, make sure they're highly pure and sequence is good and all that. So when the human sera comes, we can do the analysis. So what I, and they were the, these two A3 viruses represented by the Georgia 19, you've got a very good eye. Um, they have changes in the hemagglutinin that are very significant, okay? So it's a T135K, so that removes a glycosylation site at position um, 133, and we know that can impact antigenicity. I140K and the S145N, so that also, that 145 position is really important in antigenicity. And so it was clear that we, we actually were starting to make... Uh, you know, uh, potential candidate vaccine viruses out of that group as well, and still continue to do that. But they were somewhat deprioritized as the evolution of the virus happened because for some reason, although it's antigenically advanced in both ferret antisera and human antisera, it's not winning in the world of evolution of competition of influenza viruses the way the 3A, the 2A, 3A1s were. Um, and so we haven't seen it likely has some advantages of those changes, but there's likely some fitness loss, say for example, in a non-immune host where it's not binding receptor as well, it's not as stable, you can think of a million things and we don't ever know why, but for whatever reason, it's not increasing. Nevertheless, it could be one that you're discussing six months from now when it gets an additional change either in the hemagglutinin or a change in the neuraminidase that compensates a little bit for that fitness loss. So it likely evolved in a highly immune population um, and it's just not competing well in, uh, with all the other viruses in the population as a whole at the, this moment in time. But, but, but the flip side of that is that the ones that were to the right of the screens, the, they are in the 3A but not the Georgia they right. maintained reactivity with the Darwin, right? Yeah. And so, so yeah, so here's the, the crux of the difficulty that you have in selecting, you know, as a committee and selecting the antigens and we have as a committee in the, in the larger global scale. It's clearly the evolution of these 3A1s. It's, we saw it last spring, but we weren't very worried about it because uh, we still saw good reactivity with Darwin 6 ferret antisera for the most part and Darwin fix six anisera was covering the breadth of that tree really well. Um, 
And we didn't quite know yet because it was still not a, a large group of viruses, how well it would do in that in the evolution of influenza viruses in our population. And what we've seen in this time frame, and I showed you in that local branching index, is really a rapid increase in these particular clade of viruses. And with our tools, we're not seeing much of a difference. And I can almost guarantee that the current vaccine we have for the Northern Hemisphere will do quite well against these viruses. But the question is, if these viruses that are continuing to expand have a lot of, and they basically been in Asia where we have a lot of humans, right, that live there and a lot of competition between viruses, if they continue to expand, which they're likely to do, and acquire some additional changes that give them a little bit more antigenic uh, forward evolution compared to say, for example, Darwin-6, then having a vaccine in that group of viruses will be better. It will do much better, even if these acquire two more substitutions or something that would push them further away from Darwin 6. Mm -hmm. By, I mean, I, I really consider this update for the Southern Hemisphere not a major update because really we're staying right in that same clade of viruses. These are the most successful group. We have an antigen in Darwin 6 that we know is really a good antigen. It really creates good titer. We've known it's got good vaccine effectiveness for H3 viruses. And really what we're doing is keeping the same base number of amino acid substitutions that Darwin 6 has and adding that 140K, which we've seen in, it's in just one epitope that we've seen in multiple clades. So even though it's a different clade of virus, say for example, the 2B with the 140K, one would anticipate that priming the human immune system with that 140K will do better against all those viruses with the 140K, for example. And then there's the other mutation that likely matters is at the 192. So really, it's, it, in, in some ways, it's similar to the H1. It's not a huge antigenic difference between those two vaccines, but it's, it's moving a little bit closer to the influenza evolution. Um, it, if you remember, Darwin 6 was really a, a really great selection in a way because it was Right uh, during when the COVID pandemic was happening, we had very few viruses that were circulating to choose from. And that one really represented a, a, an antigenic group that looked to be expanding and created a breadth of immunity. And, and that's what it turned out to be. So it's a little bit hard to move away from something you know is working good. But it's what I think you have to do with influenza because it gets you closer, you know, it brings you closer to the virus in its evolutionary activity. Um, okay, thank you. Dr. Perlman. Welcome. Yeah, I just had uh, two, sorry for my hotel room, it looks weird here. But um, no I worries. Just, yeah, so uh, great talk, Dave. Um, so two questions. first, is, uh, is surveillance at the same level as it's been in the past with all the uh, political issues that have been occurring so that we have the same kind of reliable data? And the second question is one probably that could have been uh, people who are doing this for a long, long time can answer. If you go from three, uh, uh, four immunogens down to three, do you get a better immune response to the three remaining ones? Yeah, so that's both really good questions. And so I think with regard to surveillance, even with, you know, there's always some geopolitical issues happening in any, almost any influenza, you know, time frame that we're analyzing viruses, because the system is fairly um, diverse, we get a lot of redundancy. So I think we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, it was much, uh, as I just mentioned at the end of the last question, it was actually much more challenging uh, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic when everybody was using a lot of non pharmaceutical interventions and having to work on SARS itself, uh, not being able to do as much flu, but we just really didn't have a lot of flu circulation. And so um, some of the countries that had it were able to get viruses to the, all the collaborating centers, et cetera. Here now we're in pretty good shape. Um, probably some reduced amount of, of uh, virus specimens from Eastern Europe, um, but a lot still sequence data from that region. And so we can select specimens that represent those, those samples when we do our analyses. And then to the second part of the question, I have not, I was not around when we moved from a trivalent to a quadrivalent. And I think it would be better for FDA to address that question. I think there's potential um, that you, if there's any immunodominance issues or things like that, that you may actually uh, have a benefit. But I don't think we saw a lot of 
negative impacts of adding Yamagata in the first place. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. James. Thank you, Dr. Whitmerth. Um, uh, as we think about the composition for this year, and especially as we, you know, address some of the discussion points around um, how to make decisions for, for, for following year's composition, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, you know, has, has, has the group uh, done calculations? You know, there's, as you described, there's a lot of work on, that's gone into selecting the panel of viruses that are, that are tested. And in particular, I'm looking at, I'm thinking of the ferret, ferret antisera data, a lot of work gone into selecting the panel of viruses that are tested. Um, but, but I'm wondering about how those neutralization results could be integrated across the, the panel of viruses that are tested. And in particular, would it be possible or has, has it ever been done to calculate, let's say the, the median uh, neutralization titer across that potentially circulating panel of viruses um, to inform, and, and, and one could conceivably do that calculation, I would envision, um, under different compositions of, of next year's vaccine um, to, to inform that, that, that decision or, or what would be the barriers to doing that calculation? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. And and actually we do do that. So we it's we call it antigenic inference. So if you can imagine a tree, maybe I'll share a, I don't know. So we do this now in partnership with um Trevor Bedford and Richard Nair's group, both in Seattle, Washington, and Basel, Switzerland. So they are the co-developers of a thing called Next Strain. And you can yourself go to the next train site, pick seasonal influenza, and not only see those types of trees that I showed you, but underpinning some of that is antigenic inference data uh, coming from all the collaborating centers so that you can look at how antigenically distinct the various viruses are. We also take the antisera to potential vaccine candidates and see how well we have different charts that we can use. It cross reacts with the various, it's just a little bit too much data to show you and it gets very involved, especially online. Uh, but um, it's, I think I've shown, I gave the, the address for where I showed you the two trees and the local branching index. In that same area, you can pick local branching index. You can take, you can pick antigenic advance and you can pick uh, some things that underpin the antigenicity. And so it will take um, two tested viruses and infer the evolution in between them to be about the same. So it can't do much going forward. But if you have data against, you know, a group that now has 192F for, as an example, and the base that didn't, you can kind of assume the things in between, how, what is their antigenic profile? And so we use a lot of that now, and it's particularly useful in looking at potential vaccine antigens because we want one that looks to cross protect against all of those groups better. And I think that's might've been what you were driving at. Right. Thank but it's, you. It's, we, we, we're quite, um, we're trying to make everything as transparent and publicly available as possible. So all of our sequence data ends up in near real time. Like as soon as we're confident that the data is correct, it gets into publicly accessible databases. And the easiest way for people to deal with it, from my perspective, is this next strain, which takes that data and automatically makes trees and does a lot of this phylogenies for you. It can't do some of the detailed stuff that I showed you, um, but it does an awful lot. Uh, Dr. Wentworth, you're staying with us during the discussion, right? Yes. So, Hank and Steve, would it be okay to ask your questions during the discussion to David? Because we're uh, yes. stay with the agenda. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I'll, no remember, problem. No problem. I'll remember that you two are the first to ask questions during that time. And we will break now. Uh, we have only seven minutes remaining uh, for a break. Uh, so why don't we reconvene at 10.35?
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> in the next portion of our meeting, we will be hearing from industry uh, representative uh, regarding challenges and opportunities for vaccine strain composition with the reduced public health threat from influenza B Yamagata lineage viruses. Uh, to go over this topic, we have Dr. David Greenberg, the Global Senior Expert Medical Strategy at <clears throat> Vaccines for Sanofi. Dr. Greenberg? Yes, thank you. Uh, these are uh, Dr. Weir's slides. So um, did you want Dr. Weir to go first or change the slides to mine? Uh, you are on the agenda first. I think you should go first. Uh, can we get assistance from uh, Joseph to display Dr. Greenberg's slide? Slides. Ah, uh, yes. One second. Well, uh, while those are being pulled up, I'll thank you now for the opportunity to present the industry perspective uh, during today's VRPAC meeting. I am David Greenberg, Global Senior Expert Medical Strategy at Sanofi, and the, the presentation I'm about to give was prepared in consultation with each of the other U.S. licensed influenza vaccine manufacturers. And we'll have those slides up shortly. Apologies. Thank you very much. You can go on to uh, the next slide, please. I'm an employee of, of Sanofi and my disclosure is shown here. Next slide, please. Before getting into the content of the presentation, I'd like to comment that this is a fast moving and complex issue. Following consultation with the other manufacturers, we submitted the industry slide deck uh, to the FDA last week, and a great deal has occurred in the last six days, including the discussions and recommendations at the WHO strain selection meeting on September 29th. We recognize that some of the industry slide content uh, is already out of date and deserves update. So I will do my best to provide that in my comments today. I'll start by saying that we want to maintain and build public confidence and trust in influenza vaccines. We value our partnership with public health authorities, regulators, and the scientific community and other dedicated stakeholders to provide timely access to influenza vaccines and reduce the burden of disease worldwide. We hear and acknowledge the ongoing concerns regarding B. Yamagata. Through this presentation, we are looking for cross-sector partnership 
and an organized approach that preserves public health and confidence in influenza vaccines. While it would be helpful to have scientific regulatory and implementation frameworks to help guide the proposed removal of B. Yamagata, we recognize we need to be agile and efficient in the transition. We are committed to work diligently with the FDA and other regulatory agencies worldwide. Please also understand that our interest in documenting the rationale and framework stem from our discussions with vaccine experts in the US and elsewhere, whereby they have challenged us to justify the rapid change. Some of the topics we should consider during the transition include um, the following. Expectations for transparency around public health decisions to main confidence in the vaccination programs. Acknowledging that QIV and TIV have similar reactogenicity and tolerability profiles. We do not want the public to misinterpret the removal of B. Yamagata as related somehow to these safety uh, parameters. Recognizing that the risk of B. Yamagata reemergence from manufacturing sites or laboratories or LIV reassortment are hard to quantify. They're likely close to zero, but um, because of robust safeguards that have existed for decades, and these risks may be lower than the reemergence of residual undetected viral circulation or perhaps evolution of strain circulation during the post-COVID era. So continued viral surveillance will be critical to monitor for reemergence as we move forward. We fully acknowledge several recent public statements by health authorities, of which only the first one is shown on, on this slide. At the end of the European Influenza Congress two weeks ago, Dr. Zhang said the question is not if, but when to remove beyond Magata from seasonal vaccines, and the transition should transpire in an organized approach. And the second statement being the opinion of last Friday's meeting uh, from WHO uh, Vaccine Composition Advisory Committee that B. Yamagata in QIV is no longer warranted and every effort should be made to exclude the component as soon as possible. And the third stems from uh, Dr. David Wentworth's uh, uh, comments following the WHO meeting. I'm paraphrasing, hopefully in an accurate way, that the transition is going to be different for different companies, whether or not their TIV licenses were retained and whether their manufacturing process have changed and he acknowledged the transition will take time. With all of this in mind, the purpose of our presentation today is to offer a timeline um, for this transition that best balances the desire to move quickly and with the commitment of ensuring uninterrupted supply and maintaining access and confidence in these important influenza vaccines. Next slide, please. While we're aligned in executing the removal of B. Yamagata, we recognize that transition timelines will vary based on vaccine platform, manufacturer, and various global um, rules, regulatory rules. Following the WHO and MHRA meeting um, on July 13th, the manufacturers responded to a questionnaire to determine realistic steps for a successful global transition to TIV and so some of those data are shown here on the slide. There are 355 TIV licenses worldwide that need to be reactivated um, or submitted or resubmitted. Uh, 1,490 TIV variations uh, needed to be updated with regulatory agencies globally. And health authorities in 174 countries will require new submissions to update uh, manufacturing CMC and quality data to align uh, with current quality standards. Now, the timeframes shown here are estimates in the WHO regions based on historical standard regulatory practice, up to 36 months in the Americas, Europe, Africa, and Western Pacific, up to 48 months in Southeast Asia and Eastern Mediterranean. So given our commitment to a successful transition, we look forward to receiving clear regulatory guidance and support from the FDA and agencies worldwide. We ask that the FDA provide leadership to this uh, discussion globally and help reduce these timelines in the international markets and uh, international regulatory agencies. So with this global view in mind, we now wanna um, offer specific timelines for both Southern hemisphere on, and Northern hemisphere transitions. Next slide, please. So I'd like to focus on the Southern Hemisphere uh, first. Um, we appreciate the critical role that Verpac has in recommending influenza strains um, that the manufacturers will use in producing the Southern Hemisphere uh, vaccines and shipment to those countries. 
Given the regulatory submissions noted in the previous slide, we asked VRPAC to make a strain recommendation for both TIB and QIB during today's meeting, which will sustain global supply and avoid shortages. The timelines to obtain approval for the transition from QIV to TIV will vary among national regulatory agencies throughout the world. While TIV licenses are only inactivated in the US, in many countries, TIV licenses were either completely withdrawn or were never granted, thereby requiring manufacturers to submit new marketing applications that will need to be reviewed and approved. There are Southern Hemisphere countries that rely solely on CBER as their reference authority for, to um, uh, release vaccine. That is, we cannot ship vaccine to some, some Southern Hemisphere countries without VRPAC strain recommendation and FDA release. For Southern Hemisphere countries where QIV is licensed but not TIV, we can only ship QIV. If VRPAC does not recommend four strains, then manufacturers may not be able to supply those countries. So in summary, we asked VRPAC to recommend strains for both TIV and QIV formulations for the Southern Hemisphere 2024 season, consistent with the recent actions of the WHO, while manufacturers work with dozens of NRAs on the required regulatory processes to execute the transition. Next slide, please. Now let's shift to the US and Northern Hemisphere. Um, that is the next VRPAC meeting in March. While we are committed to a successful transition, it's important to recognize that it will take some time. There is significant amount of regulatory work that, was, that will be required to transition to TIV. Since we're unsure of the regulatory timelines, that is manufacturers have not yet met with CBER to discuss what is needed for their specific regulatory filings. There is a substantial risk to US supply if we're faced with distributing TIV alone just nine to 12 months from now, that is the summer and fall of 2024. There are important manufacturing changes that have occurred since TIV was last distributed in the US. And these changes require a dialogue between individual manufacturers and CBER. As of today, there's no clear regulatory framework um, for reactivation for each one of the manufacturers. Those discussions are yet to come. Based on our analysis and timeframe that I'll show you in the next slide in a few minutes, we propose that CBER maintain QIV licenses through this VRPAC meeting um, and when you meet again in March. We will pursue activating TIV licenses in parallel, but allowing both vaccines to coexist through these two VRPAC sessions would be prudent and avoid supply disruptions. I'd like to illustrate the, the challenges with concrete examples. Since the time the TIV products were discontinued in the US and internationally, many changes have occurred in the influenza vaccine manufacturing, infrastructure, quality, testing, container closure, packaging or presentation of influenza vaccines. And these changes have not been implemented with TIV. For some products and presentations, a TIV formulation was never licensed in the US. Manufacturing facilities across multiple companies and external partners were built and brought online for QIV, but TIV has never been manufactured in those facilities. End-to-end -end manufacturing, including quality and validation in many sites are QIV specific and will need to be reevaluated and dossiers submitted to regulators for TIV. Traditionally, it can take up to 18 months to generate new validation data and submit them to the agency to support licensure. So, Clearly, we look forward to working with CBER to find a more rapid pathway for approval of TIV licenses wherever necessary. We should also note that when VRPAC meets again just five months from now to discuss the Northern Hemisphere 2425 strain selection, most QIV orders will have already been placed uh, by customers and manufacturing will, will, will be well underway. Therefore, we ask VRPAC to select and recommend four strains today and in March to give, a, give the industry time to obtain regulatory approvals for TIV. Next slide, please. This diagram illustrates the vaccine manufacturing timeline for US supply for uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, next season. As a reminder, industry manufactures and distributes uh, between 150 and 200 million doses of influenza vaccine for private and public sector use in the US each season. 
has shown, the reality is that the process for the next hem Northern Hemisphere season is already underway. If industry manufactures only three strains and then fills and packs TIV only, but full FDA approval for the new TIV formulation is not accomplished for each manufacturer by July 2024, then U.S. supply may be compromised. We note that customers will submit their pre-orders for QIV in the next few months. So the transition involves more than just manufacturing and regulatory approval. There's also substantial work to manage customers, which is a complex and a complex network of healthcare providers and uh, healthcare systems. I've shared this diagram with you today to illustrate that the entire Northern Hemisphere supply or a significant portion of the supply to be shipped next summer and fall could be lost if manufacturers produce TIV exclusively and some unpredictable circumstance were to prohibit obtaining final regulatory approval for TIV in time. I would like to underscore the complexity related to multiple different manufacturers and products, platforms, presentations, that are necessary to fully supply the US um, uh, uh, healthcare provider and system, um, uh, uh, system. The significant number of unknowns that are across this complex environment requires us to keep QIV as an option for the next Northern Hemisphere campaign in order for all of us to achieve our shared goal of providing an ample supply in a timely manner, allowing patients to be protected from the risk of influenza. Next slide, please. Before wrapping up the presentation, I'd like to highlight that industry is open and interested in developing new QIV formulations to address the burden of influenza and improve protection against currently circulating strains, thereby contributing to improved public health. Industry will collaborate with scientific experts, rely on um, uh, surveillance globally. One option is to consider QIV formulations containing A3A strains, We'd like to collaborate with regulators to allow for some flexibility in QIV formulations based on unmet medical need. We will partner across multiple disciplines as shown on the slide. The potential to transition to QIV could be achieved in a timely manner if significant development is undertaken and partnering with regulators to align on requirements. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we are committed to maintain confidence in vaccines and enable a stable, predictable environment for influenza vaccine manufacturing, supply, and immunization campaigns. Acknowledging the current lack of public health threat from beyond Magata circulation, we will work diligently to transition to TIV. We are dedicated to improving public health, influenza vaccine confidence, vaccine supply, and coverage rates in the U.S. and globally. The transition to TIV will require close collaboration with CBER and many other regulatory agencies worldwide to reactivate or resubmit more than 300 TIV licenses, nearly 1,500 variations, and quality uh, data to be updated in 174 countries. For the Southern Hemisphere 24, we request VRPAC to recommend strains for both TIV and QIV formulations as we work diligently with regulatory agencies and health officials worldwide. Given the lead time required for seasonal influenza vaccine manufacturing, con contracting, distribution in the US, we request VRPAC to recommend strains for both TIV and QIV only one more time after today. That's just five months from now um, at, the, at the March strain selection meeting. And finally, we plan on exploring new QIV formulations to improve protection against currently circulating strains by seeking collaboration with regulatory agencies and vaccine experts. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and commentary during the discussion session. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Um, we will have time to ask him and Dr. Weir questions after Dr. Weir uh, goes over his presentation. So Dr. Weir, Director of the Division of Viral Products in the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at CBER, will give the FDA perspective on the challenges and opportunities for vaccine strain composition with the reduced public health threat from flu B Yamagata. I would call it absent threat right now, but that's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is 
briefly go back in time and review the development of quadrivalent vaccines and how we got there, not just from the historical perspective, but I think it's somewhat instructive as far as the issues that we everyone wrestled with and particularly the types of data that we use to make that decision. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that, then I'll talk about recent developments and then go through a couple of slides each with challenges. You've already heard quite a few of these and some opportunities and then we'll open it up for discussion. So if you go to the next slide. Okay, this one's titled The Need for Quadrivalent Influenza Vaccines Containing 2B Strains. Beginning in 1978, trivalent influenza vaccines incorporated one influenza B and two influenza A, H1, H1 and H3 components. Influenza B, though, diverged into two antigenically distinct lineages in the early 80s. And you can see a little diagram that I swiped from a nature communication paper that shows the timelines for these uh, uh, subtypes of a, influenza A as well as the divergence of influenza B. Uh, influenza B was estimated, this was after the divergence into two sublineages, was estimated to be responsible for about 26% of influenza infections in the years uh, 1999 to 2012. During that time, though, the mismatch frequency between the recommended strain and the most commonly circulating influenza B strain was estimated to be about 50%. In other words, the recommendation sort of missed about half the time. I've thrown a couple of references for anyone that's interested. And so discussions began at both the WHO, VRPAC, other places around the world in the early 2000s to discuss the feasibility and the benefit of adding a second B strain to the seasonal vaccine. Next slide. Okay, there were major issues that were discussed over this period of time, uh, and these had to be addressed before uh, there was a consensus on developing a quadrivalent vaccine. First of all, understanding the public health need and the value added by modifying the vaccine composition to cover both influenza B lineages. There was actually quite a bit of concern about whether 50% uh, of the vaccine should be devoted to influenza B when it caused 25% of the disease burden. There was also the question of manufacturing capability and whether we were going to make a mistake of recommending a quadrivalent vaccine vaccine and then find out the capacity wasn't there to actually do this. Uh, so anyway, there were a lot of these, these issues. The VRPAC started meeting and, and convening during the strain selection meetings to discuss the issue of two circulating strains. Uh, parallel discussions were taking place, WHO, other public health agencies. But as far back as 2007, uh, the VRPAC actually discussed, had a session on discussing the public health impact of two influenza B lineages. Uh, some of the conclusions were listed at the bottom of this slide. B viruses were a major cause of epidemics every two to four years. They were prominent among children and young adults. The impact was less than that of H3N2, but probably either equal to or greater than sometimes H1N1. Uh, infections. There were manufacturing concerns related to different formulations. The capacity, there were some technical challenges. I'll mention this in just a minute. And then, of course, even by even at the point in time of 2007, there was some question about what were our regulatory options and how we would actually uh, make this uh, happen as far as um, having a second strain. Next slide. That was 2007. A couple of years later, the Verb Pack met and had further discussions about the utility of adding a second strain to the to the C, a second B strain to the influenza vaccine. Uh, at that Verb Pack, CDC presented an analysis that predicted a moderate public health benefit of including both B lineages in the seasonal vaccine, as far as in terms of reduction in cases of influenza and hospitalization. The committee had further discussions at that time about the public health impact of the two circulating uh, lineages and uh, and whether we should recommend influenza vaccines containing two B strains might be considered in the future. Uh, the committee was 
particularly interested in the possibility of this for the pediatric population, but the take-home message from the meeting was that the committee encouraged all parties to collect more information to better understand the issue and to support regulatory decisions, including, including uh, regarding inclusion of 2B lineages in the seasonal vaccines. Uh, as you know, shortly after this meeting, there was a pandemic, but for the next several years, manufacturers worked with the FDA and other regulatory agencies as they developed candidates quadrivalent vaccines and conducted the clinical trials to generate supportive data uh, for future vaccines that might contain two influenza B strains. The next slide. Uh, this is actually talks about the actual licensure of quadrivalent vaccines. Uh, and there was a VRPAC meeting in February of 2012. Uh, at this point, this VRPAC meeting was the first time that we actually made a recommendation for a second B strain. At the time, none of the manufacturers were licensed to make quadrivalent vaccines, but we wanted the uh, recommendation to be made because we knew they were on the horizon and they were close. And in fact, the committee asked representatives of every manufacturer to come to the microphone and, and, and report on their progress. And each of them came up and gave the status of their development. One admitted that they had already submitted a BLA to the FDA, although none were licensed. The committee was very enthusiastic at this VRPAC. Uh, they expressed enthusiasm for a quadrivalent vaccine, and they were remarks that they hoped one or more would become available soon. And sure enough, later that year, quadrivalent vaccines began to be licensed. I want to point out that, and this is, uh, addresses one of the earlier questions from the committee today, approval of the quadrivalent vaccine was based on manufacturing and clinical data generated by each manufacturer that demonstrated safety, of course, uh, but also the immunogenicity of the second B strain component that was added, as well as that the addition of that second B strain did not adversely affect the immune response to other vaccine components. So that was the data package and summary that we used for the approval. Uh, all currently distributed in seasonal influenza vaccines in the U.S. are quadrivalent, uh, basically 1H1, 1H3, a BVIC, and a BVM component. Next slide. So I have a couple of comments about recent developments. As you've already heard several times today, there have been no confirmed detections of circulating B. Yamagata lineage viruses since March 2020, suggesting a greatly reduced public health threat and the possibility that these viruses are no longer circulating in the possibility. I do want to remind everybody that there is no animal reservoir for influenza B. In our previous FERPAC meetings, committee members have discussed the recommendation for a B. Yamagata component for a quadrivalent influenza vaccine, considering the absence of detectable B. Yamagata viruses worldwide. At our last meeting on March 7th for the Northern Hemisphere recommendation, the VRPAC made the usual recommendations on the selection of strains for the 2023-2024 Northern Hemisphere season, and as always, we were asked to vote on each vaccine component. Just to quickly summarize for the questions 1, 2, and 3, which were H1, H3, and B. Victoria, the votes were 13 yes, no, zero no's, and zero abstain. For the fourth question, the contained uh, for the B. Yamagata component, the vote was seven yes, two no's, and four abstains. Uh, to summarize the, the meeting minutes at that uh, VRPAC, the majority of the committee agreed with the WHO recommendation to continue to include a B. Yamagata component in quadrivalent vaccines for the Northern Hemisphere season, primarily because of the uncertainty as to whether a B. Yamagata virus lineage was truly extinct, that the consensus was that the issue would require further discussion at future VRPAC influenza strain composition meetings. The next slide. Okay, so this summer, the WHO organized a meeting. We had it on the 13th of July to discuss the issue of the influenza vaccine B. Yamagata component. We had a lot of participation from regulatory agencies, WHO, manufacturers, other influ interested in influenza vaccine stakeholders. Uh, the meeting was held in conjunction with the 36th biannual meeting between the WHO Essential Regulatory Laboratories, the WHO Collaborating Centers, as well as the manufacturers. Uh, 
Uh, there has been a meeting summary written up. I don't think it's published yet, but just to summarize, there was general agreement at this meeting that in the absence of circulating B. Yamagata lineage viruses, that component uh, should of the vaccine should be removed. There was no agreement at this meeting about the timing of such action. There was a lot of discussion, but no agreement. There was concern expressed by manufacturers about the manufacturing and the regulatory issues that would need to be addressed. There was some concern expressed by some participants about the possibility of a B. Yamagata return. As you've already heard at the WHO, uh, when the WHO convened the vaccine consultation meeting last week, they added this statement uh, that you already we've already read out a couple of times. The absence of confirmed detection of naturally B. Yamagata uh, lineage virus is indicative of a very low risk of infection by B. Yamagata lineage viruses. Therefore, it is the opinion of the WHO Influenza Vaccine Composition Advisory Committee that inclusion of a B. Yamagata lineage antigen in quadrivalent influenza vaccines is no longer warranted, and every effort should be made to exclude this component as soon as possible. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to a little bit of the challenges and opportunities. Uh, first of all, the challenges for reverting from a quadrivalent vaccine, what we have now, H1, H3, a BVIC, and a BM component, to a trivalent with H1, H3, and a BVIC. So, listed at these as regulatory challenges. Uh, as you've already heard, and we acknowledge this, regulatory processes for reverting to a trivalent formulation differ in different parts of the world. Uh, that's true. In the U.S., all manufacturers of quadrivalent vaccines were originally licensed to produce trivalent vaccines, and these vaccines are, are still licensed even though they're currently discontinued. We do have processes in the U.S. procedures for removal of vaccines from the discontinued product list. You've also heard that there are manufacturing changes. Some manufacturing changes have been implemented for quadrivalent vaccines since the prior licensure of trivalent vaccines. Uh, we acknowledge that these changes that have been implemented for quadrivalent vaccines are specific for each manufacturer. So, uh, in other words, some may have introduced new filling lines, new presentations. Others may have done other, made other changes. Uh, I will point out, though, that in the U.S., most of these manufacturing changes that are relevant to a trivalent formulation have already been reviewed as part of the quadrivalent license. Not all, but most. Uh, as I said earlier, there was some concern expressed in the July meeting about the reemergence of B. Yamagata viruses. Uh, I will point out that we do have a robust surveillance system, and most of us, including the WHO collaborating centers, think that this system is adequate to monitor reemergence. And of course, the way to mitigate this risk or this worry is to retain quadrivalent licenses, and that would facilitate an appropriate vaccine response. And then finally, the challenge the timing challenge. Uh, it is probably true that a global coordinated change in vaccine composition to a trivalent formula, formulation may be difficult to affect, and this is for all the reasons listed above and that you heard in the previous presentation. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the challenges in changing, some of the challenges in changing the composition of influenza vaccines from the current quadrivalent composition to an alternative vaccine composition. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because at every one of these meetings and every flu meeting you go to, there is always a lot of speculation that one could develop a different composition uh, instead of the current 1H1, 1H3, 1BVIC, and 1BM. So I wanted to, to talk about some of the challenges here before I get to the opportunity. Uh, first of all, there is a, a challenge in developing a consensus regarding an alternative composition. We've had, we have seen and heard that there are several alternative composition possibilities, and these have been proposed. I'm going to mention some of these on the next slide. But the process for making an alternative composition recommendation has not been defined. There is also the challenge of generating the clinical data needed to support a particular alternative composition. Uh, this data would be required from each manufacturer, and the data would need 
would be needed for each alternative composition that was proposed. Uh, there are also technical challenges to a different composition. Uh, some of the ones that are obvious I've listed here, determining potency, determining identity, and then also determining to evaluating uh, clinical outcomes, in other words, immunogenicity. All of these are challenges because of the close relatedness of some uh, uh, two different H3s, two different H1s, and some of these other combinations. Uh, one of the other challenges that we have to keep in mind is determining the effect of an alternative composition recommendation on vaccine timelines. Uh, with our current H1, H3, BVIC, and BYAM vaccines, manufacturers have a defined uh, process, a time frame that they use, but they almost always prepare at least one of these antigens at risk before strain selection decisions. So I think before anyone makes a uh, of changes to the composition, we would all have to ask ourselves whether there is any effect on the timelines that result from that. Uh, the next slide. Now I'm going to get into some of the opportunities. Uh, first of all, this just sort of states the obvious, I hope. Uh, the disease burden of influenza remains high. Uh, you can see I've, I've put in a slide from the CDC website uh, clearly, and I think uh, Dr. Wentworth mentioned this at the start of his talk. Uh, there's clearly plenty of Ill influenza illness, hospitalization, and deaths every year. This hasn't changed. Uh, the other thing that hasn't changed is the, the uh, burden presented by influenza B remains at about 25% of all the influenza cases in a season. And of course, all of us acknowledge that current vaccine effectiveness suggests that there's room for improvement. Again, if you just go to the CDC website, you can get uh, vaccine effectiveness data for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And I quickly looked at this and noted the adjusted vaccine effectiveness data ranges anywhere from 19% to 60%. So there's clearly still room for improvement. And that I still think presents us as an opportunity to ask ourselves whether this is a change a chance to actually make uh, a vaccine that is somewhat better. Next slide. Okay, so this is some of the other opportunities. As I said earlier, uh, several different alternative compositions have been proposed. I listed one reference here that was a fairly recent publication that listed some of these. We had presentations at the WHO meeting in July, uh, but you've also heard these over the years, uh, all sorts of proposals. Some of the ones that are, that are most commonly proposed I've listed in the second bullet. Uh, for example, having two H3 antigens. Sometimes you hear proposals for two H1 antigens, but here the idea would be to better cover circulating virus diversity. Uh, there have been proposals for higher doses of H3 antigen. This would be to hopefully improve the effectiveness against the virus with the greatest public health impact. Uh, and then there have been proposals for higher doses of all vaccine antigens to improve the overall vaccine effectiveness. And here I just want to remind people that our experience with high dose flu zone uh, here with 60 micrograms of antigen as opposed to 15, the 15 micrograms in the standard dose, uh, this results in the elderly with uh, greatly improved antibody titers and improved effectiveness. So there's reasons to support any of these compositions. The flexibility in composition recommendations would allow a timely response to virus diversity. Uh, these recommendations would have to be driven by public health need and by consensus. Uh, the technical considerations would have to be addressed. As I said, potency, identity, uh, clinical evaluation. It would be preferable to do these type of uh, to work on these technical considerations by collaborations between manufacturers and most likely the WHO essential regulatory labs. Uh, and that was what was done for influenza B uh, when we had two, to, to uh, such that we could make an influenza vaccine with two influenza Bs. Uh, I remind you that every composition under consideration would need the supporting data from each manufacturer to update their license. And our data needed for development for quadrivalent vaccines provides a general guide. In other words, immunogenicity of the new component, lack of interference with other vaccine components, and safety. So to summarize the last two slides. Development of quadrivalent influenza vaccines containing two influenza B antigens succeeded in eliminating mismatches between the vaccine component and the predominant circulating lineage of influenza B. 
Accumulating the evidence indicates a greatly reduced and possibly non-existent public health threat from the B. Yamagata lineage viruses. The absence of circulating B. Yamagata lineage viruses suggests that inclusion of a B. Yamagata lineage antigen in quadrivalent influenza vaccines is no longer warranted. Reverting to a trivalent influenza vaccine with H1, H3, and BVIC components presents some hurdles which differ around the world, but are probably manageable by coordinated efforts between industry stakeholders and regulatory agencies. Next slide. A change to an alternative influenza vaccine composition is an opportunity to provide flexibility and improvement for current vaccines, but this is going to require additional work, investment, and coordination among all stakeholders. It is unfortunately, I think, unlikely that removal of the B. Yamagata component from current quadrivalent vaccines can be coordinated with a change to an alternative composition. There's just a lot to be done. Uh, global harmonization and standardization of any alternative influenza vaccine composition will require, at a minimum, prioritization and consensus on the alternative composition to be considered, the generation of supportive data from each manufacturer to ensure the safety and effectiveness of new alternative compositions, and finally, and of course, the updating of licenses. I'll stop there. I think that's the last slide. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Zweer and Dr. Greenberg. I wanna remind us that at at uh, 11.20 sharp, we need to be in the open public hearing meeting, which has no one registered, but we still have to acknowledge uh, right at 11.20 that this session is on and then move on to, you know, to, to the discussion. With that said, we probably have time for a couple of questions uh, on, or maybe one question until 11.20. And I think Dr. Chatterjee, uh, was first to, to have a question, Dr. Chatterjee? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Uh, I actually have several questions, but I will ask my first one now. Um, so this is for Dr. Greenberg. Uh, you mentioned that um, there are some countries where um, the trivalent uh, formulations are not um, approved and um, that it would require approval by the FDA for those countries um, to, to then use the, the um, trivalent. So in the absence of that approval, uh, they are obligated to use quadrivalent. Did I understand that correctly? The, <clears throat> thanks for the question. The, the um, issue or topic is that uh, for some Southern Hemisphere countries, they rely on release by the US FDA of lot by lot, batch by batch, um, the vaccine that can be shipped to those countries. So although they may or may not have their own in, um, a national regulatory agency, they rely on the US FDA for release. So we need to continue to work with FDA in the US to, um, to be able to release, let's say a quadrivalent to a country that is, it does not accept uh, trivalent yet. So my question then was um, for other manufacturers outside of, of the U.S., um, do these countries have access to um, trivalent vaccines that um, might be shipped from other countries, for example? I do not have that information. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question before the break is from Dr. Gans, assuming it's a brief question. It's not I, I can reserve, yeah, I can reserve mine. Thank you. Okay, Anna. do you mind keeping your hand up so I know to call you after? Okay, I'll have a very quick question. Uh, this is, um, uh, Securus and Sanofi are the two companies for which we meet in the fall for, for the Southern Hemisphere in terms of FDA licensure. Uh, what, is, what is their uh, share of the market in the Southern Hemisphere? I can begin to address that. Um, our understanding that for the two manufacturers that you just named, that uh, there's a, a, approximately um, up to about 10 countries in Southern Hemisphere 
um, where where our companies ship and require the US FDA release of those batches. And we're in the range of um, 10 million, maybe up to 20 million uh, doses distributed to those countries. And, and I'd say most likely the majority of them are um, in Latin America. And are y'all the sole supplier? Uh, that I don't know. And, I, you know, in, in addressing that question in the previous one, you know, I, I can't say for sure whether or not there might be other suppliers that, that could fill the gap, but you can imagine there would, there would be some disruption. I, I would say that there's a, there'd be a pretty good risk of um, a pretty high risk of, um, of, of lack of supply or um, supply disruption or timing of supply if they were to have to make arrangements with other you know, sources. Right at 1120, thank you. So now uh, we are in the open public hearing session. There are uh, no uh, participants who have registered to be in the open public hearing session. Uh, and hence, we will be moving on to the next item on our agenda, which is the discussion. Uh, Suzanne or, or, or Joseph, do you mind displaying the discussion topics? And we will keep rolling with the questions. And I think Dr. Uh, Gans is next, and then we will move to Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Pergam. I did not forget about you. Dr. Gans. Thank you so much, and thanks for all the wonderful um, conversation. I guess one of my major questions, if we moved to over the process that has been outlined very clearly, um, to remove Yamagata and we sort of keep open the quadrivalent, um, and I know as um, Dr. Weir clearly said that these all need to be tested if we were gonna move to a different formulation. I guess my real question is because of the inflexibility in the process and how long it takes to really um, allow us to make these kinds of decisions, if we keep those quote um, quadrivalents open um, and in the meantime, start testing some of the, um, and uh, as Hana had previously said, like some of the other composition strains and clades that might um, be warranted. Um, is that something that we could potentially recommend on this at this meeting? And then my question is really, if we were to change the composition, because we're not worried about Yamagata, um, and this is um, probably more for Dr. Wentworth, what would be the recommended change in composition? Are we worried about any of those H3N1s that we had sort of seen, or maybe not as well? covered and could that be a recommendation today? Uh, this is Jerry. I'm not sure if that was for me or for Dr. Wentworth, um, but I will chime in and say, yes, you certainly can make that recommendation. Uh, and in fact, that's the sort of thing that we're seeking some input from you. Again, I, I tried to stress that in the, my presentation is that there are lots of possibilities out here, but there does need to be a little focus on on some of them so that we don't have five, 10 different possibilities and, and, and something that's unmanageable. I think there does need to be some prioritization of what we think the biggest opportunity is and then start generating the data to make that happen. That's just my opinion. I don't know if uh, others have other comments about that. Over. Yeah, and I think then for Dr. Wentworth, um, since you spend the most time um, in that deep um, sort of blue um, world, what would be the recommendation if a composition change um, were to be considered for study? Yeah, I'm going to give you a terrible non-answer. So the, the, the issue is we spend all our time looking at what we would recommend for the licensed vaccines. That's really our remit as the WHO Vaccine Consultation Advisory Committee. Um, and so that's the, the major thing. 
the I'll give you an opinion now, and it's my opinion, not the CDC's opinion, not WHO opinion. It's it would be very challenging. I think if you went there, I my thought would be we would have to come, you know, have a delay for a little bit and come back with what would be the alternative. Uh, like if you wanted to do an alternative strain, what would it, what it would it be? Uh, at this moment in time, it's a little tricky because. Um, it may be something like one of the two B viruses. So you'd pick a very antigenically distinct group. So the more antigenically distinct group is the two B from the three, you know, the, the two A, three A ones that w- that was nominated. They're, they're actually not that far apart. And so whether or not that would be that much of an improvement, I think is the real question and why people like why the studies are needed to, to compare just increasing the antigen altogether versus uh, picking two kind of divergent viruses. If it were up to me to make the recommendation, I definitely wouldn't pick something old and something new uh, for the, if it was just one vaccine for every age group. And that's because of the immune boosting that you would get to the old thing would actually probably distract from the priming that you would get from the new antigen. And so those are the kinds of considerations that I think would have to be made. Now, in a young population that's maybe never seen influenza H3, that could be very valuable. Right. So it's, you know, it's kind of giving them an older person's immune repertoire, uh, you know, early in life. And, but this is really very theoretical. And so what we work with is, is more like what exactly would be in this vaccine. If the committee really pushes to do something different, I think the, uh, the, the solution from my perspective would be to say, uh, you know, come back with a recommendation. And then we could look at the CIRA with that in mind. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to go back uh, to Hank. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, This question for Dr. Wentworth. First of all, your presentations are incredibly enlightening, and I learn so much just listening to your comprehensive uh, detail. And uh, in my mind, you will be missed. Um, I, uh, As Dr. Ware reminded us, there was a mismatch um, 50% of the time between the B lineages uh, included in the trivalent vaccine over a 10-year period, even longer, uh, with that lineage that's circulating in the communities. So in your mind, what most supports the evolution of the virus during the three-year period of the pandemic with SARS-CoV-2 co-circulating that's now reflective of what we can anticipate prospectively for future flu seasons? That part's not clear to me. And I know Dr. Rubin asked a little about modeling as well. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for your remarks. I really appreciate that. That's very kind. Um, the That's a really challenging question. And I'll just proceed it with a little bit of history. And you've been on the committee quite a while and you'd know some of these things. It's just I'll take, recall them. So prior to the pandemic, um, first, uh, right towards the end of 2018, beginning of 2019-ish, we had the emergence of uh, in B. Victoria lineage viruses, what we called a double deletion mutant. It was a deletion of amino acids 162 and 163. And the vaccine that you all recommended, we recommended as a committee uh, for the WHO was called A. Colorado. Uh, I've forgotten the year. I think it was a 2019 isolate or it could have been 2018, but so, something around there. And so that was an A. Colorado recommendation for that double deletion variant because it had a big antigenic impact and really uh, affected the viral uh, uh, antigenicity. And we did see a lot of those viruses cause a very early influenza B epidemic. Um, And so it was good vaccine, et cetera. Then Very quickly after, within six to eight months, we had the emergence of um, a triple deletion mutant. There was one triple deletion mutant that almost emerged at the near similar time as the B Colorado double deletion, but that didn't seem to have a lot of uh, what we call legs. It didn't have to have a lot of fitness, and it kind of 
didn't go anywhere. But a second triple deletion mutant emerged in the exact same site. So it was 162, 163, and 164 were deleted. And it also had a change at K136. Um, and that group was even more fit, or he did displaced that double deletion group within about a six month time frame. And again, we had a very early B Victoria lineage season. And then the next season that would come up was COVID pandemic where all influenza contracted. So I think really part of the B Yamagata demise is quite similar to how we have, uh, when we have a pandemic with human influenza, it will often displace the previously circulating virus. So for example, H2N2 influenza displaced H1N1 influenza in 1957. We no longer saw H1N1 that had been circulating since 1918, uh, very fit virus in humans, but that even though it was very antigenically distinct, H2N2, Coming in early and sweeping lots of people had a huge immune response that could be both, you know, kind of non-specific, lots of innate immunity, et cetera, when, a, when the old virus is trying to replicate, as well as recall memory response to maybe non-neutralizing parts of the virus and a lot of T-cell responses to those viruses. So I th my hypothesis really is that these two waves of distinct B Victoria lineage, even prior to the pandemic, was heavily impacting Yamagata. We really didn't see any Yamagata. Then the pandemic happened, and we and, and again, we didn't see very many flu viruses. And what came out of the bottleneck of the pandemic, we didn't see Yamagata again. So uh, to look into what's going to happen in the future with the current B. Victoria viruses, I do not know. Currently, they seem to be, as I showed you in the tree, minor you know, changes all along the, the hemagglutinin, but nothing really looking like it's being selected for. And so in one way, that means that the virus is quite fit or quite happy in its current antigenic state and doesn't have a lot of pressure on it. Um, whereas Yamagata apparently has a lot of pressure on that virus. I hope I answered your question, but that's a bit of a conjecture, a lot of conjecture about potential demise of B. Yamagata because it really started before the pandemic even happened. So SARS-CoV-2 sealed the deal. Yeah, maybe it's it's in, there is studies where even the two very different viruses can interfere with each other, but really there was all the non-pharmaceutical intervention type things that we all did, staying at home and masking and reduced travel and all of those things. So I think we had a very, uh, B. Yamagata was under tremendous evolutionary pressure prior to the pandemic and the pandemic may have sealed the deal. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Perga. Thanks. Um, David, again, I would just, um... I would say that um, one of the highlights of being on this committee is actually um, these talks that you give. It's it's they're fantastic. So it's um, it's really a pleasure to have you here and best of luck in the new position. I think we all agree that you're a, a, a tremendous asset um, to to um, this committee for sure. Um, I, I just was curious, and this is sort of a, an odd question, but I'm curious about the gaps in actual the data collection from the WHO. Um, I still feel like there's areas of the world that are not really covered well. I mean, I look at the maps that you show, and an example would be Russia. We don't really have much in terms of, you know, viral sequences from those areas. Is there any concern from, you know, the committee about areas where you're not getting enough data? I'm kind of following up on um, Dr. Perlman's question. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of travel around the world, and, and strange should be shared, but I'm always amazed at the... Um, sort of these micro environments that are creating these new variants that are um, slightly different. So I'm curious, is there any concern about gaps in the data that you guys have from areas where you're not getting quality data or limited data um, or not necessarily just Yamagata, but just in terms of decision making about this? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for your comments. It's very kind. So I, I think Yes, we always have concern about gaps. And this is one of the things. So the WHO Global Influenza Program um, within the Pandemic Preparedness and Response uh, 
kind of division, I've forgotten how they define it, um, which is headed by Wen Ching Zhang, really does a lot of work in this space looking at gap analysis. So where do we have gaps? How can we help? And so part of it is building an infrastructure to where, you know, turn the lights on where it's dark in a country that is maybe in an important area. The one thing I would say that gives me a little bit of confidence within the regions, like if you go a little bit higher than countries and get into WHO regions, these are sometimes called transmission zones. They're more regionally geographically oriented, but we do have good coverage within a region. Now you pointed out Russia, and this is one of the, one of the, is to Dr. Perlman's questions, one of the, usually we have a lot more sequence data from Russia and um, actually have more viruses from Russia at, at the collaborating center at the CDC and the collaborating center at the Crick Institute in London, the worldwide influenza collaborating center there. It's really not, so there's two national influenza centers in Russia and they're both, they're both working and collecting viruses, and we are getting some sequence data out of those centers. But it's the shipping difficulties that have led to that in this, in this period, the last couple of years. Uh, it's shipping difficulties and, and, uh, that have led to some problems there. But overall, one of the goals is to identify those gaps and then try to support countries that are interested in doing flu surveillance. And that they have to understand, you know, it really has to be a country's decision. If they have not a lot of influenza burden compared to their other diseases, you know, how much does it impact them? Do they even get vaccine? How much does it impact them? We have a lot of countries contributing that actually don't use influenza vaccine. So it's not perfect. But I do think from a regional perspective, we're in pretty good shape because of the, some of the things we can do. It could be improved tremendously by um, training. So CDC and WHO and the, all the other collaborating centers work hard to train national influenza centers on detection. We provide reagents for detection of, you know, of hundreds in the hundreds per month. Um, that kind of thing is supported uh, at a global level. So it's not all led, you know, one country dependent that it has to be a huge investment to do at least um, sentinel type surveillance. But it can be improved for sure. But I think overall, it's one of the best systems for the viruses just because it's been around for 70 years. And it was kind of the backbone for SARS coronavirus 2 surveillance uh, during the parts of the pandemic. Thank you. Archana had additional questions. Dr. Chatterjee? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Wally. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Um, <clears throat> I think these are both for Dr. Greenberg. Um, one is regard with regard to the timeline. If I understood you correctly, David, you were talking about an 18 month or so timeline to be able to meet uh, the um, requirements uh, for uh, trivalent formulations that could be used across the world. Um, my question is about, uh, I mean, I, I understand the manufacturing, the regulatory and, and the technical issues involved. One of the questions that I think could be asked that could be asked is, and recognizing that SARS-CoV-2 is a completely different virus and we're dealing with a pandemic, the resources that were deployed were completely different, but we were able to go from zero to having a, a vaccine within 10 months uh, that was deployable. Um, the question may be asked is why is this process going to take this long? Uh, and could that be the timeline be shortened any at all? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, the, um, there's a couple of aspects. One is that we're already moving. You know, we're, we're, we'll have these discussions with FDA um, soon and with the other national regulatory um, agencies. The, uh, I don't think of it as 18 months um, in the sense that, you know, Southern Hemisphere of the vote is upon us today. In March is the Northern Hemisphere uh, recommendations. Um, so in my mind, we're just talking about the next six months. Um, yes, then of course the manufacturers produce vaccine and, and distribute um, for that season, but that's really all that we're discussing. Um, after that, we'll you know uh, you know 
I certainly hope that the discussions, particularly with the U.S. Um, FDA, move along you know swiftly and efficiently, and that uh, we'll have then the go ahead for trivalent, you know, right after the the, the next season. So really our caution about the Northern Hemisphere season coming up and the March meeting is that there is so much work to be done between now and March that we're not sure if all of the regulatory steps can be completed um, and that there's so much confidence that there would be, um, that, that all the manufacturers would have their approvals for trivalent in time to ship only trivalent in the next Northern Hemisphere season. You know, again, shipping started next July, August, September. Um, we don't know. It's more of an unknown than it is anything else. And we have to move forward with our, with our manufacturing and with the contracting and then of course working with the agency. So we would, you know, honestly, we just want to be able to work with, with, with you and the agency to ensure that there's not a supply disruption in case there's um, an obstacle that we just can't seem to figure out how to solve in time for the shipping uh, next summer. So that's really just the short-term concern. Beyond that, we're planning to have TIV. And so we'll, that, that's our goal is to work directly with, um, with the agency and do that. And then, and then for, the, for the other countries, we'll come back to you. you know, we'll come back to you for the Southern Hemisphere 25 season we hope that each of those countries where they rely on the US FDA release, we hope that they're all, you know, given the manufacturers the ability to ship TIV. And if so, then, you know, then it, it's, it's a good win for everyone. But we'll come back to you um, because, again, those discussions haven't taken place yet. So it's really just this meeting and a meeting in five months. And then we hope to be right on track with what, um, you know, the, the, the VRPAC committee and the agency would like. Um, Dr. Alzali, I do have another question for Dr. Greenberg, but I can hold it until um, later. Well, why don't you go ahead? It's fine. Oh, okay. Um, so th this question is is related to some of the comments we've heard, I think, from Dr. Weir and Dr. Wentworth uh, with regard to alternative uh, quadrivalent formulations. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about where the industry is at uh, with working on uh, obtaining the clinical data needed to support those formulations? Well, the, the, the first step, of course, is, as was just discussed minutes ago, about what is the right um, formulation um, and with what strains. So, you know, none of us today have that answer, but we are very interested in, um, in exploring those. And of course, it's going to depend from company to company. Um, but those discussions then can take place with the agency and those, each of those manufacturers, each of those companies can conduct uh, clinical trials as, um, as they wish. So um, I don't have an answer for you today, but I, I know that there is interest among um, generally the manufacturing community to move in that direction. And yeah, there's, there's definitely work to be done, not only in understanding which, which would be the right um, strains, um, say in a, a 3A uh, formulation, uh, but then also the, the, the potency testing, um, the immunogenicity testing, uh, the HAIs and so forth, that all have to be worked out. Um, so it's also not a, a quick step. Um, and then we would, you know, we in industry would conduct the clinical trials um, just as we did a dozen years ago when when we conducted studies of, of quadrivalent um, at the time that only trivalent was available. So um, don't have an answer today, but, but you know, we're, I think as an industry, we're sincerely um, interested and want to work with um, you know, those who are here today, as well as, as others in the, you know, stakeholder community around uh, vaccines. And so what are we looking at for a time frame to have all of that um, completed? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm hesitant to, to give a specific timeline, but you know that, um, and again, I'm reaching back to when industry moved from trivalent to quadrivalent, the, you know, probably phase one, two trials 
may or may not be needed, but if they are, they're probably going to be, you know, relatively small and quick. Um, and then phase three studies are probably going to be, you know, probably in the range of hundreds of um, subjects, uh, individuals who participate. It's not to look at efficacy, which, as you know, is a, a much larger question, but at least, you know, confirming the non-inferior safety uh, or safety parameters and non-inferior um, immunogenicity uh, data. So you're looking at, you know, a season or two to be able to conduct those studies, but, you know, perhaps that could be done efficiently in both the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere countries so that um, you get to the answers needed uh, rep pretty rapidly. Thank you. Dr. Ruben. Thank you. And I'm not sure who to address this to, uh, perhaps Dr. Greenberg, but um, if we do move from a QIV to TIV, and with all the discussion that um, you were just mentioning about uh, the possibility of introducing new antigens for a divergent A or B virus, um, do we lose anything in terms of the capacity to move back to QIV if we were to add another antigen? In other words, you raised the pot, the you know the issues around regulatory or the regulatory issues. Would it be harder to make another QIV if we move to TIV? Both from the both from regulation and production. Uh, yes, thanks. N not difficult from the standpoint of manufacturing, you know, and and, and um, you know, manufacturing those antigens. Uh, but capacity, yes. Although I don't, again, don't have all the answers. There could be an impact on capacity. Um, uh, you know, having manufacturing facilities across all the different companies um, running um, full speed for many months to produce four, uh, you know, working with four strains. When that reduces to three, you know, you, you can see how that could, um, I would think, reduce capacity overall. Then to ramp back up to quadrivalent is not difficult, uh, but takes some planning. So, I would just remind you all that part of the um, rationale, justification, beyond the obvious of coverage of two B lineages at the time that the decisions were made, was that it increased capacity and that in the event of an influenza pandemic, there would generally be you know, increased capacity to meet the, the, the challenges, the demand of a pandemic. Uh, with a reduction of to, to trivalent, you lose a little bit of that. I, I, I think we have to admit that. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to try to uh, frame them according to the points displayed on the screen for, for discussion. Um, in terms of advantages of retaining the B, it, it's probably, not probably, there is none um, for, for the public health uh, uh, aspect of it, the manufacturing aspect of it and the regulatory uh, aspect of it, things were not nimble enough uh, to um, to remove, looks like the Yamagata, at least for some manufacturers. But that is a bit concerning because this is the fourth meeting uh, for Verpac where this is brought up, although the voting uh, directions are not um, are not um, sort of uh, the only metric to follow. There was one when we were way into the pandemic. It was noted that there was little flu circulation, but of all the flus that came about, Yamagata seems to be non present. Uh, and then it was brought up that the decline in Yamagata really began pre pandemic. But at the time, no epidemiologic conclusion could be made because of the pandemic. Then we exited the pandemic in a way uh, two meetings ago, and the voting was unanimous to keep the Yamagata, but the absence of Yamagata circulation was brought up, was discussed, and pretty much everyone who voted said, uh, this we will keep this vote going just in case Yamagata rears it rears its head and to allow regulatory agencies and manufacturers time to adjust. 
last meeting, the voting was 7-6, with seven keeping the Yamagata. But even the individuals who did vote to keep the Yamagata, it was precisely to allow time for manufacturers and regulatory agencies to adjust. Because there's no, uh, there's the risk benefit is no longer there to keep the Yamagata. Uh, but what I'm concerned about is that it seems like we are going to begin the discussion about it now with manufacturers and regulatory agencies. I wonder why this not has not taken place so far, and um, which would have allowed that proposed timeline to either have shifted dramatically into you know a smaller interval, or not even be there. And this question is to Dr. Greenberg and to Dr. Weir. Well, from, from the manufacturing standpoint, uh, we understand. And while we we're um, aware of the discussions that took place at previous VERP PACs, um, then I look now to Dr. Weir that um, well, we didn't have really substantive um, uh, meetings at that time. So here we are, and we've listened, and we're ready to act. Uh, but I, I, I can't reverse the past. We are where we are, and we're acting. Um, but uh, Dr. Weir, if you if you have some comments as well, thank you. Yeah, I do have a comment. Um, I I sense and feel your frustration, Dr. Sally, but I'd like to remind you that the VERPAC discussions are having an effect on moving this process, whether you believe it or not. Um, I actually think that this meeting that the WHO held this summer was a direct result of the voting in March. In fact, I'm pretty sure it had a lot to do with it. So while I understand that you may be frustrated that it's taking a while, uh, I do think it's having an effect. I do think it's moving the conversation forward. And I do think that you're going to see some tangible results for this at some point, and I hope the near future. So again, I understand it, but I, 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 I again, I think all of you in the VERPAC are having an effect and you're doing an important service by, by stating these concerns and stating what you think about this. I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful you're saying that and I think everyone on the committee is, but it looks like discussions didn't start. I mean, just judging from the presentations this morning. Uh, okay, Dr. James. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question, I think, for Dr. Weir. Um, I, um, I was struck by a statement that uh, Dr. Wentworth made when, when he was asked about, you know, how how could we, you know, what, I think the question posed to him was, you know, what, what could an alternative quadrivalent uh, vaccine formulation look like? Um, and and how to optimize that? You know, what what, what would be the the framework? Um, and and I think his response was something to the effect that, you know, it, 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 there's so many, so many, so many components to that decision. So many possible tweaks to the quadrivalent um, composition that that it's hard to answer at this point. And he suggested that that it might be easier to consider a, a specific proposal along those lines. You know, whether it was um, and that specific proposal would include both a framework for making a decision as well as a, a specific proposal in terms of the quadrivalent um, composition um, that, that's optimal under a given framework. And, and, and that really rang true to me. Um, and so I guess my question to Dr. Weir and, and others, if they wanted to weigh in on it, is who would be the, the party or parties responsible for proposing such a framework and such a composition? Is, it, is that sort of, on, is the onus on the manufacturers to come to the committee with a with a given proposed quadrivalent uh, formulation that that's that's thought to provide uh, better efficacy or is it 
um, FDA or, or some other entity who is, who is responsible for sort of moving us forward and, and proposing a, a formulation for rethinking this. Okay. I will give you my opinion. I think it's all of our responsibility. Um, the flu community has a very unique track record of working together. Uh, unlike almost every other vaccine, uh, we, we, and I say we globally, and this includes manufacturers, includes this worldwide network of influenza centers, collaborating centers, ERLs, and lots of academic researchers meet periodically. They do, dis we all discuss these things, and including we have these discussions at our advisory committee that we're all part of. I think this is what I meant about trying to stress the need for a consensus. So my personal opinion is that we have these scheduled meetings at least twice a year, and this is sponsored usually by the MHRA but, and the WHO, and we have them in July and, and January usually. I think that's an ideal forum to try to get some sort of consensus of what, how one would prioritize a an alternative composition, because I do think that you could list so many possibilities that you will never get uh, every, the data needed for everything. So I do think that is one forum where we can do it. I think the input from the verb pack uh, that we take to those meetings is important. That's what I was trying to tell Dr. El Sally a minute ago. I think your, your voice does get heard. So I, I think this is a, a, is a combined responsibility of all of us to try to work together to see if we can make some improvement to the vaccine. I don't know if that's a great answer for you, but I really do believe it. So I, I think we express those opinions here. We express them in these meetings where we all get together, and we hope that we drive something toward a prioritization of what should be investigated first and start generating this data. Uh, anyway, that's my personal view. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Portnoy? Thank you. I have to, to agree with Dr. Weir. When we voted uh, last time uh, to uh, recommend that this be changed, it was really a recommendation for the process to be gone and for the discussion to occur. And it sounds to me like it exactly has. So I think that the, the vote, vote of this committee last, uh, last uh, six months ago really did make a difference. I have two questions about the current influenza vaccine and one about the other, uh, the, about possible future vaccines. One, if the flu zone, uh, the higher dose is more effective at inducing an immune response is given to older people, why isn't it just given to all people? Why only older people? Wouldn't younger people benefit from a better immune response also? That's my first question. My second question is I was just wondering if, if there's any effort to switch the influenza over to a mRNA-based vaccine like the COVID. Uh, I know that the legacy system is in place and it's so much more convenient and uh, economically feasible to continue producing influenza in chicken, eggs, and acellular, and so on. But it seems to me that we would have a much more flexible uh, uh, ability to change uh, strains if we needed to on the fly almost if we had an mRNA technology. So I was just wondering if I could get a status update on, on that. <clears throat> so I can give you partial answers to both of those. Um, first of all, high dose flu zone. Uh, is for elderly because that's who it's indicated for. That's who the clinical trials. That's where the how the clinical trials were done. Uh, so to expand that indication, there would have to be some clinical data to support it. Uh, the agency, of course, is open to anything that when someone comes in with new data, uh, that would be up to the manufacturer to decide that that was worth exploring and then see where the data led them. Um, I threw it out there because I thought that it was a good example of the fact that, and again, this has been brought up many times about whether one could consider increasing the amount of antigen in the vaccine. I just thought it was a good example to show that there was at least some basis to think along those lines. And while I'm at it, I'll remind you that our current vaccines for the standard doses of 15 micrograms haven't always been 15. At one point in time, before my time, uh, they were seven and a half, and I don't remember what went into doubling it. Um, okay, mRNA, yes, there's a lot of effort in this area. I'm, I, I'm sure that you and others have seen press releases from different companies 
uh, as well as academic, as well as papers in the literature. Yes, there's a lot of movement toward this. Uh, many companies are exploring mRNA uh, uh, platforms as a possibility for flu vaccines. Uh, when the data is there, they will come to the agency and then we evaluate them like we always do. So yes, I, it, it's very active. Over. Okay, okay. I, I, I hadn't heard anything, so it's nice to know that there's some movement in that direction. Hmm. Dr. Uh, Gantz. Thanks for um, giving me another opportunity. Um, so just along um, the lines of sort of how you addressed this, Hannah, I think that, um, you know, before us right now are the advantages and disadvantages of retaining or removing the Yamagata. And there really is, at least from a public health standpoint, no advantage. The only advantage we have to keeping it is to allowing those individuals who would otherwise not be uh, um, have access to influenza vaccines, period. And so I do think we need a better understanding is if we, as part of our Southern Hemisphere, um, and I, I think, again, you were trying to get at this a little bit, Hannah, what is our contribution to that access question? Because if we took it out of just, if, if we at this moment in time says there's really no advantage to continuing it, and therefore we voted to remove it, how, I, I guess I'm still struggling to know the exact disruption to the market and access to other um, individuals since we're not as prevalent in the Southern hemisphere um, production um, as far as I understand it. And therefore um, that contribution is not as well understood to me and I would really like that addressed better. The other, um, so I, I don't see an advantage except for access. So we really need to understand what our contribution here is. And we're very strongly saying that we have said for many times, we don't think there's continued advantages and we only voted for it last time with that notion. I think there are a lot of opportunities. Dr. Wentworth goes through a very um, detailed evaluation of the um, lineages that are coming through. And um, clearly there's some um, H1N1 5A that isn't currently being as well addressed. And then the 2B for the H3N2s, those are things that I would then now like to put out to have companies and other people start looking at um, the advantage of um, having those be part of a quadrivalent. I don't know what percentage of the um, disease is related to these. And that would be another thing that I would love to see um, as we're understanding these um, different, very complex um, array of um, stereotypes. We would love to know what percentage. So we understand by adding that to a vaccine, what improvement we would have over what we're currently um, having. And then as been raised, um, not only by Dr. Weir, but just um, by Dr. Portnoy, I'd like to say that the other um, opportunities would be to look at the dosing. So we have certain dosing that we thought was efficacious. Obviously there are certain um, of these strains that actually don't do as well. And so, um, we should be considering different dosing strategies. And then lastly, it would be really nice, I mean, as has been pointed out, as if we could have other manufacturing methodology. So if we're looking at alternative vaccines, um, that would be something that I would like to push forward. Um, and then lastly, because we've asked for this in multiple times, I mean, Dr. Weir, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Wentworth clearly um, stated how um, B cell immunity is very important for infection. We know that and T cell for um, actually um, clearing, but what also is immunologically important about T cells is the breadth and depth. So it would be really nice to know if um, we're seeing some advantage of T cell epitopes um, broadening the expansion without actually putting um, another strain into these. So some of those studies that are being done as we are using that as a model for SARS-CoV-2, 
would be very nice to see addressed in influenza and how that immunologic um, paradigm is being changed, not necessarily by all the different ways in which we change the vaccine, but actually by the breadth and depth of what um, antigenic stimulus you've seen in the past. So those would be the directions that I would just put forth. I don't know how to be more precise without um, some of the data that we need. Thank you, Haley. Um, uh, I think you had more comments and viewpoints, but not a specific question, right? Yeah, I mean, my my real question is um, how how specifically should we formulate our recommendations? I guess. Oh, okay, Doctor. We are are we uh, to give specific recommendations here, or just discuss and then whenever there's a vote, we can. Right. So, okay. So, yes, obviously, of these three bullets, the third one is the most open-ended discussion. We're happy to oh. hear ideas, and we will welcome that. I think the one that probably it would be helpful to get some specificity from the committee members is the second bullet. Uh, you've heard the proposal from the manufacturers and what they think is realistic. Both, uh, mostly globally, uh, but I think I would like the committee, if possible, to chime in about what they think is a realistic timing for this. And I, I guess, I think... Dr. Ware, if we said now, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand the, the um, impact that would have on the um, accessibility of vaccines for the global market. That's what I'm really trying to understand. Agree, and and what I think you're you're sort of hearing is that the impact immediately now for the southern hemisphere is mostly an access and availability question. The question for five months, or basically northern hemisphere twenty four twenty five, is more of a what how much time it would take to effect these different steps, both in the U.S. as well as the world. So they're slightly different. Uh, yes, if that's why I think I said at the very start of the meeting today that depending on the recommendation, we would have to go back and think through these things too. I mean, the last thing we wanna do is affect vaccine supply, even worldwide, even though our main our main responsibility is of course for the US. Uh, so yes, it's a lot for us to weigh, but, but I would still like to, if possible, get specificity from the committee about what they think is realistic for the timing, if possible. Well, if I may begin on, on that point, uh, we have already weighed in that Yamagata ought to be removed six months ago and to a degree 12 months ago, at least for the process to begin. Uh, now, realistically, we, we are not in the, in the manufacturer's, uh, you know, we cannot expedite the, the manufacturing or 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 um, or affect it in any way. Uh, so the the question to us is scientifically and from a public health standpoint, uh, when should it be removed? It should be removed a while ago, but at least now. Uh, the only problem is would anyone who would have benefited from a vaccine uh, be affected by such a decision. And that is what I don't have a grasp on, meaning if the two manufacturers who, for whom we meet in the fall uh, were to not get their quadrivalent uh, opportunity to, to, to deliver their quadrivalent, would it impact any country's public health negatively, because we definitely don't want to do that. But I also wonder on the flip side of it is, would, would us uh, saying now uh, is the time to remove uh, be what makes those wheels go in faster motion? So for that, I would ask Dr. Greenberg to weigh in. If, if you had time to, to, to investigate what is the, um, contribution of, of these two manufacturers to the public health of 
the specific countries you supply, just these two manufacturers. Yes, thank you. So um, we've been able to collect some information. I don't have all the answers, but I do know that about 10 countries and 10 to 20 million doses are at stake. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's too much to think that countries in a very short period of time, because you know, we'll be shipping, we would be shipping vaccine uh, as an industry to the Southern Hemisphere countries um, in the coming months for them to find other sources and have other contracts and have vaccine availability and the timing to help protect their populations. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have that, um, that visibility, but I have to think that 20 million doses um, lost um, to a handful of countries is going to have some impact to public health. And yeah. although we haven't, you know, we haven't gone to TIV for the Southern Hemisphere uh, season, um, we're, you know, we're now going to move in that direction, you know, as, as uh, efficiently as we can. Okay. I mean, the difference between 10 and 20 is significant, but uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Cohn. Thanks. Um, I just want to ask a question, I think to either FDA or to the sponsors, but I'm wondering if there's been any, um, any research or focus groups into how the public would perceive, um, these changes to the vaccines. I'm, I'm, Thinking about this from a public um, trust in the flu in the influenza program, um, especially in the U.S., given um, some of the challenges we've been facing with other vaccines, and um, I was just wondering if there's anything you guys have done in, in the space of um, how this would be uh, uh, interpreted publicly. Do you mean keeping the Yamagata or removing the Yamagata, which is? Really? Removing, okay. removing, okay. which you know, and how they would understand those messages around, um, you know, from my perspective, this is an example of um, us responding to taking out things that aren't necessarily providing benefit. But if that would be sort of how it would perceive, be perceived publicly, or if um, it would cause confusion and mistrust. If, if I could just um, say that from our side. We're very interested in um, getting answers to your questions. Um, we're, uh, we, I, I, we don't have extensive surveys um, that I could report to you today. We've had um, discussions with a lot of um, public health um, and other stakeholders, and they have really challenged us on um, the speed and what impact it might have in the public trust. Uh, but that's not the same as a large array of the public, of healthcare uh, professionals and others. Without question, uh, um, as we go through this transition, we would want to work with um, you know, all of the different stakeholders to, to help with the communication to maintain the trust. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive that doing nothing around communication will create um, some, you know, some real issues for all of us to deal with. So I would say let's partner together to make sure that communication is, is clear. I can add in that for us, we've thought about that. And yes, I would agree with Dr. Greenberg, some sort of unified messaging approach would be best. And the issue also came up when we, in July at the WHO meeting, I think everyone recognizes that it would take some effort toward messaging, but I think it can be presented as a response to uh, public health and trying to do what's best for vaccine composition. So I think there's way to do, ways to do that messaging, but of course, the more unified the message is, the better. Over. Hmm. I agree with with Amanda, with uh, with David, and with uh, Dr. Weir as well. But if I may add, also some messaging as regarding keeping the Yamagata, if that ends up being the outcome, is needed. Uh, Dr. Pergam. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I need. To, I'm still trying to clarify this in my head um, because there is the ability to still give 
the trivalent vaccine. We are proving that. So what I'm trying to understand from industry's perspective, let's the southern vaccines have already been ordered. They're sort of, you know, that process has begun. I'm also beginning to think ahead to our next meeting a little bit too, is, you know, if can the manufacturers sort of have that ability to produce significant numbers of both trivalent and quadrivalent, where they would be able to give these to different places where there are different, you know, approvals in the early phases. And is that a challenge to have those two different versions like they previously did? That availability, is that a challenge for them to be able to sort of give these to different components? So if, as an example, if we decided next our, our next round that we wanted to do just trivalent, um, is that feasible? within the structures that exist right now? And if others decided to do the same, would that be possible to, to sort of have a slower rollout of trivalent? And then as they wait for the quadrivalent, you know, regulations and other locations to sort of be approved. I, I'm just trying to figure out the process of this because it feels like in some places, trivalent is already approved and that would, it feels like it should be an easier transition to that. I, I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to get what that, looks like from a global perspective because can we vote for two different formulations as we're talking about here and what we already do is we vote for a trivalent version and a quadrivalent version and is that enough to allow that process to move forward i'm just trying to figure out how does it work from a manufacturing perspective to have those two formulations and how can you guys manage that sort of approach if that were to be you know something that you'd see like the u.s goes in a trivalent move or the North 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 America is that way. What does that look like from a manufacturing perspective? I hope that makes sense. It's it's a complicated question, I know. I was going to answer it's a complex answer. <laughs> um, thanks for the question. So a lot of that I think actually is going to be better addressed by by FDA. Uh, but from a manufacturing perspective, uh, you know, we, we we produce the strains. The reason why I made the point on behalf of manufacturing regarding um, you know, moving to the, the discussion on the Northern Hemisphere uh, for the next season is that manufacturing has already started at risk, uh, even now in, in October, we're in October. Um, so it's the process has started. Um, there is, a, you know, a tremendous amount of coordination that occurs um, when we're speaking, you know, collectively of manufacturing of, of um, you know, more or less around 170 million doses of vaccine and decisions are made in manufacturing facilities uh, at an early stage, made right now um, as to whether the final um, vial filling, syringe filling is going to be a trivalent or a quadrivalent uh, formulation. Um, it's not something that you can decide at the last minute. So my point on behalf of manufacturing is that for the Northern Hemisphere season, you know, through the next six months, we can move as rapidly as we can to that, you know, getting the, the trivalent um, approvals, making sure all of the, the validation data um, are, are with the agency and they're reviewing them and approving them. We're making decisions now and in the coming, you know, weeks to months on what ends up in the filling line to then ship out starting in July. It's a it's a process in parallel. We can we can work with the agency collectively as manufacturers to move towards trivalent. But when it at the end of the day, when it comes to um, packaging, filling and packaging the product to ship starting in July in the U.S., those decisions are made really in the next few months. So. Do we as manufacturers, can we guarantee that we're going to have all the approvals that are necessary for reactivating the, the TIV and updating the, the quality data um, uh, and, and validation data to know for sure that all we need to do is package trivalent and then ship it in July, August, September? I don't see how that's possible across the manufacturers. And so if we were to take that risk then I'm really worried that we would have a major shortfall in vaccine distribution 
next summer and fall. So we're going to move with the agency to get the IV. I just don't see, and again, speaking for all the manufacturers, just don't see how we can guarantee that what we what we package in vials and syringes can only be TIV and that we're absolutely guaranteed that we'll be able to ship them because we, we haven't had the one-on-one -on -one discussions with the agency to get us to that you know, final uh, point. Thanks. Dr. Monto. Well, I'll start out with full disclosure. I was present at the July 13th meeting in London and uh, actually uh, wrote the first draft of the summary of the meeting that is circulated. Uh, and uh, Dr. Al Sali, there was clearly an effect of the VERPAC uh, discussions and recommendations. However, at the same time, I was rather surprised that while uh, the global influenza regulatory and uh, recommending community had heard the concern about uh, the continued inclusion of the B. Yamagata, the manufacturers really hadn't heard it. And there was surprise and uh, somewhat, uh, uh, I may say, dismay at the possibility of moving very fast. And that's where we first heard some of the especially regulatory concerns. I think I'd like to move to the discussion topics because they really frame what we have to do today. And uh, going over the discussion topics, the advantages of including the B Yamagata are only to me uh, being sure that we can have total synchrony in the world of switching to the uh, trivalent formulation or whatever follows. Uh, the, the needs are mainly regulatory, but also logistic. And I uh, think that these need consideration but should not necessarily be the driving force in what we do in the United States because it looks like things may proceed at different rates in different parts of the world. I'd also like to uh, remember, uh, let everybody think about the fact that we still do have trivalent vaccine being produced and who are the countries that typically use the trivalent vaccine. It's not a clear division, but it's the uh, more affluent countries that are currently using the quadrivalent vaccine and it's the other countries uh, that use uh, the trivalent vaccine. It's not a clear uh, distinction because local manufacture and things like that fall in. But what we're talking about here is uh, removing a component of the vaccine which hasn't uh, been uh, detected in greater than three years. Not only that, the component that we have in the vaccine is a 2013 virus. Mm -hmm. And if we do have B. Yamagata reemerge from some hiding place, the likelihood of a, B, a 2013 virus protecting against that virus, uh, that strain is going to be pretty low. I'd like to move to the bullet three first before talking about the timing. At that meeting, it was clear that although we have been discussing, even in VERPAC meetings, the alternate vaccine compositions, which might 
replace the current quadrivalent vaccine, there really has not been any consistent work looking at the, the this issue. Uh, there's been work on other things like the mRNA vaccine, but very little work on some of the simple issues about, for example, increasing the AH3N2 component of the vaccine. And I had hoped that for a smooth transition, something like that would have been looked at, but very little work has been done, or at least work that uh, that we can hear about because of other considerations. Getting to the second and the key point, the timing of the possible removal, I think it's pretty clear that we can't really do that right now. Uh, the vaccine is ready to go. Uh, the, the, the manufacturing has gone on and it would be quite disruptive to move ahead with removal uh, right now in the Southern Hemisphere formulation. I feel uncomfortable at promising that B. Amagata lineage would be included in the, uh, in, in the Northern Hemisphere formulation. Uh, I think that's something we can take up at that time. We may, I think it, it may be clear from our discussion and our votes that if possible, we would like to see it removed from the Northern Hemisphere uh, formulation, at least for the United States, because I think we're in a better position in terms of the regulatory situation to do that in the United States uh, than many countries which, uh, which, which, which have a different system and in which the licenses uh, for the old tri tri the trivalent vaccine are not in the state that they are in the United States. And in concluding, I'd just like to circle back to the disadvantages of retaining the B. Yamagata. What I hadn't thought about before the meeting in London uh, was the fact that B. Yamagata is in the live attenuated vaccine. We don't use a whole lot of live attenuated vaccine in the United States, but there are at least theoretical disadvantages uh, about giving a live attenuated B. Yamagata uh, vaccine, uh, va containing vaccine, uh, and uh, beside that, in addition to the uh, uh, to the to the issue of giving something that uh, that you don't need. Uh, over. Thank you, Dr. Monto, for this summary. Uh, Dr. Wentworth. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for your thoughtful discussion. And this kind of goes back quite a little while, but I just wanted to make a comment and in part from our committee's discussion at the WHO and in part because we are a collaborating center for all of PAHO. So not just the Northern Hemisphere, but the Southern Hemisphere. There's no collaborating center from the from South America, for example. Yet they have many national influenza centers. They contributed very significantly to the update of the vaccine for the H1N1, for example. A lot of the viruses that I showed that were in the light blue came from South America. And I just wanted to comment that the loss of 20 million vaccine doses you know, so if you're starting to think about, I know you feel like you kind of have an arm tied behind your back. That's a little bit the way I felt on the committee for the WHO, but it would be impactful, negatively impactful for South America, Central South America to uh, say it had to be a trivalent. This is in part why for licensed vaccines, the committee recommended a quadra, you know, with the components of the licensed quadrivalent vaccine be the viruses we named, which include the Phuket strain from 2013 for B. Yamagata. So I just wanted to comment there because it's very difficult to ascertain exactly how many doses, you know, when you have different companies and all of that that's going on there. But it, 20 million is a significant amount of vaccine used in that region. Thank you. 
thank you, David, for clarifying that. That that is very important, uh, Doctor Anunciado. Thank you. I'm I'm going to uh, change my question to a comment uh, since we're in the discussion part of the of the meeting, um, and I just want to reiterate what Dr. Monto said that I think what we really um, want to think about is the best way to get to a smooth transition from quadrivalent vaccine, vaccines to trivalent vaccines. And as has been pointed out in the questions and answers and in the discussion, we really want to make sure that as we are working on this, that um, we don't have any unintended consequences that, that may impact, especially the most vulnerable, who sometimes need a specialized vaccine or who may be in a country uh, that has less access to a variety of vaccine manufacturers. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for the comment, Dr. Anunciado. I do not see any more uh, questions or hands. We're good? Okay. Uh, Joseph, do you mind putting the voting questions on the screen? Thank you, Joseph. And I turn the meeting over now um, to Dr. Paydar. Dr. Paydar is going to read the voting uh, script and conduct the voting uh, session. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. El Sali. I appreciate it. Um, only our 13 regular members will be voting in today's meeting. At this point, I do not know if Dr. Perlman is available to vote. So um, we will make a note of it as we go forward. Um, uh, with regards to the voting process, Dr. El Sali will read the voting questions for the record. And afterwards, all voting uh, members will cast their vote by selecting one of the voting options, which include yes, no, or abstain. You will have one minute to cast your vote after the question is read. Please note that once you've cast your vote, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. However, once the poll is closed, all votes will be considered final. Once all the votes um, have been uh, placed, we'll broadcast the results and read the individual uh, votes allowed for the public record. Does anyone have any questions related to the voting uh, process before we begin? Joseph, could you please show the next slide? Great. Okay, um, Dr. Ayotali, if you could please uh, read the voting questions, um, question number one for the record. <clears throat> Joseph, if you could please move to, yes, thank you. Does the committee recommend excluding B. Yamagata lineage antigen component from quadrivalent influenza vaccines as soon as possible? Please vote yes, no, or abstain. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, at this point, Joseph will move all non-voting members out of the main room. For those non-voting members, please do not log out of the Zoom. We'll be with you within three to five minutes. So um, Joseph, please let me know uh, when all voting members are present. Thank you.
All right, ready, ready to display results. Great. Great, thank you so much, Joseph. Um, um, here are the responses of um, the voting members for voting question num number one. Um, I'll read them aloud for the public record. Uh, Dr. Perlman is not available to vote for this question. And so please note that we will have only 12 voting members for question number one. All 12 members have unanimously voted yes. Um, great. Um, I'll read the votes aloud for the public record. Dr. Pergam, yes. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Andy Shane, yes. Dr. Holly James, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Henry Bernstein, yes. Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Hannah uh, El Sali, yes. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Okay, that concludes the first question. Unanimous votes are all yes. Okay, um, Dr. El Sali, if you could please read voting question number two. Right. Voting question number two for the composition of egg-based trivalent 2024 Southern Hemisphere formulations of influenza vaccines, does the committee recommend inclusion of an A Victoria 4897-2022 H1N1 pandemic 09-like virus, inclusion of an A Thailand 8-2022 H3N2-like virus, and inclusion of a B Austria 1359417-2021 B Victoria lineage like virus. Please vote yes, no, or abstain. Again, for those non-voting members, please don't log out of the Zoom. We'll be with you in a few minutes. Joseph, please let me know when all voting members are present. All right.
ready to display results. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, we have a total of 13 votes for question number two. Here are the responses of each of the 13 voting members for voting question number two. Dr. Perlman has joined. Um, I'll read them aloud for the public record. Uh, we have unanimous vote yes. Uh, 13 out of 13, 100% have voted yes. Uh, there is no um, other votes. Thank you so much. If you could display. Great. Okay, I'll read the votes uh, for the public record. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Andy Shane, yes. Dr. Holly Janes, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Henry Bernstein, yes. Dr. Eric Rubin, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Um, Hannah El Sami, yes. Dr. Jay Portno, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Okay, Dr. El Sali, final question. If you would be so kind to read the voting question number three when it comes up. And the last vote, <clears throat> voting question for today, voting question number three for quadrivalent 2024 Southern Hemisphere formulations of influenza vaccines. Does the committee recommend inclusion of a beef you get? 30732013 B Yamagata lineage like virus as the second influenza B strain in the vaccine. Please vote yes, no, or abstain. Um, again, for those non voting members, please just be continue to be patient with us. We'll be with you in a few minutes, four to five minutes. Joseph, let me know when all voting members are present.
results are ready to be, be displayed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joseph. We have a total of 13 votes for question number three. Here are the responses of each of the 13 voting members for voting question number three. Uh, I'll read them aloud for the public record. We have a unanimous vote yes. 13 out of 13 have voted yes. For the public record, Stanley Perlman, yes. Stephen Pergam, yes. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Arnold Monto, yes. Andy Shane, yes. Holly James, yes. Haley Gans, yes. Amanda Cohn, yes. Henry Bernstein, yes. Eric Rubin, yes. Paul Offit, yes. Hannah El Sahli, yes. Jay Portnoy, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this concludes the voting portion for today's meeting. I'll hand over the meeting back over to Dr. Al Sali for asking the committee for their voting explanation. Dr. Al Sali? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you all for participating in today's meeting and for the votes and the lively discussion. Uh, so we, I will go around the virtual table now uh, requesting uh, justification or commentary as to why uh, the committee members voted the way they did. And I will go in order of appearance on the, um, on the Zoom uh, participants, and which makes Paul Offit the first one to give his opinion. Right. Um, I'm not sure what more can be said than has already. I know. <laughs> um, I, I think my vote is sort of obvious based on the data that were presented. Influenza is a moving target. I think we're going to learn a lot moving forward in terms of how best to construct this vaccine um, as we have, for example, mRNA vaccines available and um, as we um, continue to learn about this virus. I mean, I trained in a flu lab many decades ago, and, and Walter Gerardo, who was the head of that lab, said it best. He said, if you want a research career that lasts for the rest of your life, study influenza. I still think that's true. Thanks. Very true. Thank you. Dr. Cohen. Uh, sorry, it took me a minute to get off. Um, I. I uh, also think everything uh, has been said. I really appreciate both the manufacturers and FDA's um, uh, coordination and response after our last meeting around this. And um, I, I think that the way that the questions were phrased today allowed us to both push for this to happen as fast as possible, but also acknowledge and recognize that um, we really need to keep do this in a way that is um, minimally uh, that is beneficial and doesn't pose any unintended consequences or risks. So, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Shane? Yes, thank you very much. I agree. I think everything's been said. And thank you so much for the wonderful presentations that really helped uh, to inform my decision. I would also just echo Dr. Cohn's sentiments about communication and starting to think about how we do that now uh, in advance so that we can be best prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee? Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> I'd like to make two points. Um, the first one being um, the word, as so, the phrase, as soon as possible. Um, I worked with a very experienced infection control practitioner, Ms. Sharon Plummer, for many years at the Children's Hospital in Omaha. And she would often say, soon is not a time. So I, I would say that um, I would encourage uh, all of the people that are involved to um, really try to uh, identify timelines by which we should expect to see some movement on this front. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second I'd like to make is that um, sometimes members of this committee at these meetings for, the, for selecting the flu strains have felt that we are nearly rubber stamping what uh, has been put forth by the WHO. So it was very uh, reassuring to me to learn that our time is not wasted here, that in fact our deliberations and discussions have meaning and importance and, and actually uh, move the needle. So um, I, I think that that is uh, a very important function of this committee and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Dr. Monto. 
Again, there's very little to add. I do like the flexibility of as soon as possible, but uh, there are timelines that have been discussed, and I think we need to try to see whether it's possible to do it in the United States at least. Um, by um, the time we meet uh, next March, because uh, it's going to, it's very clear that the whole world may not be moving in synchrony to the tri trivalent vaccine. I also am delighted that we are not voting on each antigen separately as we have in the past. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gantz. Thank you. Um, of course, the um, conversation has been robust, but I guess what I'm reminded is that despite conversations, there does seem to be um, quite reactive and not proactive stance from many of the authorities that are dealing with this. It's very complex. We understand that. Um, but I would say and just echo that we're going to be back here in March to make another vote. I would just really urge people to start looking at other options by that period of time so that we're not um, in the situation where we would deny access um, to any individual. That's really where the votes I think are coming from today is to really ensure that globally um, people have the resources they need to have health um, as we would all hope. Um, I do think it's very important for the public to realize that um, the safety of all of the options that are before them is very strong um, and that there's really no um, issues with that. And that wasn't a consideration today, of course. Um, I would urge the um, people who can look at this to look at the different strains. We've already um, highlighted two with the 5A in the H1 and the 2B in the H3 that seem to be um, having decreased um, antibody responses as well. As there's reduction to those um, particular strains and there does seem to be some signal around the country as was well outlined. Um, and I would also urge, cause it seems that we need to do that um, looking at other formulations that have already been described, messenger RNA, so that we're not really stuck with these kinds of timelines. Um, and um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Dr. Bernstein. Sure, I, I, I don't really have a whole lot more to say other than uh, uh, flu is a, a global uh, disease. And I do think, uh, start my video. Uh, sorry about that. I do think that flu is a global uh, disease, and I think it's important that uh, we emphasize communication, which will be incredibly uh, important. I think uh, messaging must be very clear. I think re regulatory issues need to be addressed in a timely way, and I think manufacturing issues also will need to be managed. Uh, I do think it's a positive thing for the public to appreciate that ongoing continuous evaluation of, of uh, vaccine preventable diseases uh, happens. And this is a, a perfect example of that. Otherwise, I really don't have much else to add. Thank you. Dr. James? Um, thank you. Um, I, I guess my, my focus has been on, um, you know, I, I think I've, I'm in agreement of all the comments that have been said about the sort of, um, you know, how obvious it was around the decision to, to, um, to, uh, you know, recommend, you know, for, for this particular question, removing B. Amagonis, B. Amagonis as soon as possible, but, but that's really a sort of special case of the larger decision around, 
um, how should the uh, strain composition be be decided on an annual basis, and and um, and and the issues that have been raised today around the complexity of that decision, the complexity of regulatory and manufacturing issues, um, and and the need to um, you know prepare well well in advance uh, around any um, compositional changes, um, really raises raises to me the the importance of um, advancing and advocating for um, urgent discussions around um, what what is the framework for for deciding on that strain composition for future vaccines. So so it was gratifying to hear the um, the the um, outcomes or the the implications of the VRPAC discussions on WHO consultations and other consultations that have been um, happening over the preceding year. And I guess I would just um, suggest that this th this committee again can perhaps have an impact um, in terms of advocating for using the the future biannual um, uh, flu meetings that Dr. Wentworth mentioned to to really begin to align um, stakeholders around frameworks for for deciding compositions of future vaccines. Um, uh, because in parallel, these manufacturers will need to be communicating with regulatory authorities around the, the clinical packages that will need to be provided, um, you know, to, to support um, annual uh, regulatory decision making. Um, so it, it appears that there, there is quite a bit of work in, in the academic sphere along these lines, but, but um, a, a lot to be done, again, to bring the, the multiple stakeholders on board and, and gain consensus so that um, our committee and other committees uh, considering um, strain recommendations on an annual basis can have specific proposals uh, put in place for us um, for, for future years. So um, thanks, Dr. Al-Sali. That's all for me. Thank you. And Dr. Portnoy. Great. Thank, thank you. Uh, I agree with Dr. Chatterjee that it's reassuring to think that the decisions that this group made actually had a difference in the discussions about viral composition. Uh, so that, that is reassuring. Uh, these viruses move fast. Uh, they move very quickly. They mutate and so on. And we have to learn to change just as fast as they do if we're going to use vaccines as a way of controlling and keeping these viruses under control. I, I think it's really important that we change the way we consider developing vaccines, approving vaccines, uh, and, and studying vaccines. I, I think this whole process needs to be sped up because the viruses are not going to wait for us. And if we want to use vaccines to treat them, we have to change the way we do things too. So but it's great to be part of a group that's uh, involved in making those decisions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jay. Um, I think I'm the last voting member. Um, uh, the the first the justification for the first two questions, uh, the way the vote, at least my vote went, uh, was obvious and and deliberated uh, between this and previous meetings. Uh, the voting on the third question was the, the one uh, with a bit of uh, trepidation and back and forth. However, uh, with the uncertainty uh, regarding what those 10 to 20 million doses are go going to do, and in order to avoid uh, harming anyone uh, by such a decision, um, uh, the uh, I voted to, to keep the quadrivalent. Uh, the, however, we will be reconvening in six months. And it wouldn't be the first time an influenza strain disappeared. Uh, H2N2 uh, did the same. And uh, looks like Yamagata is also, you know, heading out. And that began pre-pandemic. And um, the... the uh, process between uh, regulatory and and uh, manufacturing should take that into account uh, which uh, uh, which would be um, uh, really what makes uh, the confidence in, in vaccine and vaccine uptake uh, be stronger and with that um, I think I, oh I think I forgot Steve Bergen. <laughs> So I'm not the last. So the last word goes to Steve Bergam. <laughs> and I really didn't. I, I, I really don't know didn't why your name didn't display. That's okay. That's okay. It's, you have, okay. you have a lot of new plates, so don't worry. I, I'm not offended. Um, 
I think I didn't really want the last word because there's so much that's been said. And, and I, I think this is a great discussion today. I think it was really valuable. Um, I think the one thing um, that I would really encourage um, FDA and industry is to begin to start planning some, some studies on, you know, how are they going to look at um, new formulations of quadrivalent vaccines and start that discussion now because this is already, you know, the, I think the second year we've had this discussion, and I think there's a, a, a definitely some interest in pursuing new directions. So I think you've heard from all of us that, um, you know, we'd like to see the changes coming in the future. So I think beginning to plan those studies and, about, you know, being able to bring some data back to us about what other opportunities might exist will be really important. Um, and, and I think, as uh, one of my colleagues said, developing the framework for what that's going to look like is going to be really important. Um, so I think we all are excited about the directions this is going. And I think this just shows how important um, these the global work that goes into this, into vaccine development. Um, and I think it's a great model for future vaccines in the future too. All right. Thank you, Steve. So, and hopefully when we reconvene in six months, the issue of the, uh, the Yamagata would be behind us. That's hopefully enough time to, to, to move on. Um, with that, I turn the meeting over to uh, uh, final comments from the FDA. Um, I have a couple of comments. <laughs> One is just a big thank you to all of you. Uh, it has been a good discussion, and I really think we all value your input. My take from the discussion was that there was, while everyone agreed with the ASAP as soon as possible phrase, um, I think everyone also realized that that was not practical for right now, the Southern Hemisphere. But I did get the impression from several comments that the committee wasn't quite ready to give up on 24, 25 Northern Hemisphere yet, and that we have a few months to keep working on this. And I was pleased to hear the manufacturers say that they wanted to work with us all to see what they could do, even without any guarantees. So I think the, the, the burden is on us to do that work, to see what we can do. Uh, I also heard that everyone was enthusiastic about trying to come up with ways to improve the vaccine with other formulations. And again, though, I got the message that what the committee would like to see is some results, some the next time to try to hear something that's being done to actually try to make this happen. So I think that's another take home message that all of us heard. And once again, I would like to thank David Wentworth for all he's done for the last four or five years and welcome Rebecca Condor for future meetings like this. Once again, thank you, uh, Dr. El Sally and all of the rest of the committee. I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weir. Uh, Dr. Pedar, you, would you be the one adjourning the meeting? Yes, for closing uh, comments, I just wanted to thank the committee um, and Siever staff for working so hard uh, to make the meeting a successful, productive meeting. I now call the meeting adjourned, officially adjourned at 1.20 p.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.